All right, and we are live. So hi, everyone, and welcome to episode eight of the Game Session podcast. We did take last week off due to the holiday madness at work. Uh, I'm Jose, or the Seth Rokage. Uh, today, we are joined by Sarah. The ever-silent Sarah for the audio version. She is <laughs> waving to people. <laughs> <laughs> oh, sorry. Uh, wave. Wave. We, wave, we wave. Enjoy- <laughs> okay, we still have audio. Good. <laughs> We are joined by tech wizard uh, Mesa. Hello. So still, still, still without a camera. <laughs> what are you? Uh, <laughs> what are you grubbing on right now? Well, because I realized because I left here thirty minutes before the podcast starts, I went to the closest restaurant to me, which I forget at this time of night has like twenty minute lines for of of like five people. They're just incompetent. Uh, <laughs> Wait, what's the closest <laughs> restaurant? In and out? No, Burger King. Burger King. <laughs> Man, it was a Burger King. How could at a Burger King? It's the same damn I was thing. Say, yeah. What's the difference? It was, there was literally a, a line of like four cars in front of me. Holy shit. <laughs> That's Man. a lot. Of, it's, it's, it's stupid. Ouch. All right. And uh, I, mean, I think week. they undercharged me. So oh, that's, well, there yeah. you go. Got you. Not like complain about dude. that. Wait, what's Burger King's slogan? Have it your way. They, they, you had it your way, less money. <laughs> exactly. All right, and we are joined by a very special guest this week, uh, Twitch streamer Nitro. How is it going? It's going great. Uh, thank you so much for having me. Yeah, we were always happy to bring people on here, and you're definitely one of the most uh, cordial people, and you have some very sick uh, Smash Bros. video clips you've been sending my way. Yeah, oh. I... Okay, so I'm not doing that in order to self-promote. I just basically, whenever I make the connection that someone even casually plays Smash Brothers Ultimate, I just think, ooh, he's one of us. So <laughs> that's when the random clips start. Uh, I'm just in it for the drama. <laughs> I just want to know the so drama. There's, there's no shortage of drama in the Smash community. <laughs> oh, there isn't. <laughs> and, I'm just in it for the drama. Well... Yeah, I never actually heard someone say they're in it for the drama, but I guess well, like, if you want drama. Okay, not that playing. sounds really ter- terrible, but I'm in it to hate on those that the drama is about. I got gotcha. you. It's a good lawn chair with a popcorn moment. Yes, right. it's, it's that <laughs> yes, yes. Jason Momoa popping out the chair with like one one hand and like setting it on the ground and just like leaning leaning back in it. That's how All it right, goes. So- so Nitro, why don't you just mm-hmm. go ahead and int- actually no, I'm sorry, I forgot. Uh, do the social thing. Uh, we we are on Twitch, obviously. What you're watching right now, we're on audio uh, podcast services as well as YouTube. If you like, comment, subscribe on all the respective platforms, you can stay up to date. Uh, Twitter would be the best method for staying up to date with us on a daily basis. But Nitro, why don't you just go ahead and I guess formally introduce yourself? Who are you? What do you do? Maybe one of your favorite games. Favorite ice cream flavor? First dog? Wow, no pressure. That's a lot to discuss all at once. <laughs> okay, like so... Questions. What about are you trying to hack yeah. into? What street yeah, did like... you grow up on? What was your first car model? Well, my mother's What's your favorite name holiday? Is... Okay, anyway. So, IRL name is Michael Carusi. Uh, my gamer tag is Nitro. It's been pretty much my tag since I was 11 and thought it was badass, and I pretty much kept it consistently ever since. I am a web developer in my day job, but I've been streaming more and more, especially as I've had more time during quarantine. I'm pretty much a variety streamer. I do a lot. I do a lot of Smash streaming, and this is actually one of the first uh, Twitch streams that I've been a get invited to as a guest. So here I am. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. I, in terms of what I'm playing right now, I know that's a long list, but favorite games. A uh, couple of different options there. Chrono Trigger is uh, what I always say when it comes to my favorite game of all time. I still have yet to play it, and I feel actively bad about it every you should. day of my life. You should. <laughs> it's never too late. That's true. Just play the SNES version. Don't play the remake. Yep. I don't think I have my SNES anymore. Well, buy one. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> buy e- to one. eBay I go. <laughs> so uh, when did you first start uh, doing streaming? I know you mentioned uh, once a uh, lockdown happened and whatnot, but was there was it maybe back in March, April? You've, you've actually met a lot of success um, recently, haven't you? More than I expected. I mean, part of that is that I tend to play games that draw do draw a decent sized crowd. 
Like I stream Smash Brothers Ultimate, obviously. I stream Among Us. I stream Fortnite. I stream a lot of Nintendo games. I stream some Minecraft. But yeah, I guess once I started, I've been streaming. I would say over the past year since I got my since I built my new PC. So sp very sporadically throughout 2019, and then through 2020, I've been doing it more regularly. And this summer, I made affiliate. And hey, uh, congratulations, oh, man! Um, Fantastic. More, certainly, certainly more subs than I've expected lately. So I'm certainly not on track to be the next ninja, nor do I want to be. But it's certainly more than I expected uh, in comparatively short a time. So it's it's been great, and I have a lot of fun doing it. I think you should be damn proud of yourself for what you've done. Yeah, mm -hmm. I. Yeah, I'll take a little pride in it. <laughs> we'll have to have you and uh, Mesa chat about building PC sometime. Okay, yeah, I. That's that's been its own adventure because, you know, the funny thing about building PCs, every pre-built PC I've had has been a disaster, and I thought I was somehow cursed. And when I, I built this back in November of 2018, zero problems, none. Did you, um, were you building PCs before then, or was that kind of your first uh, foray into it? This was my first PC build in a very, very long time. I actually did bring a friend over who was a little more up to date on everything, just to make sure that nothing got screwed up or entered incorrectly. But uh, I'm incredibly happy at how it turned out. Nice. Yeah. All awesome. right, you guys want to go ahead and jump into the news? The news. Yeah, let's do it. <laughs> Three, two, one. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So I guess the right. big story, or I don't know, it is, it is a story of a certain size that may be described as big by some. Uh, the Game Awards have officially announced their nominees, and obviously there's a whole bunch of categories out there. We won't go down every single one, uh, but we'll go ahead and tackle the main one. So for Game of the Year, the games that they have chosen from... Uh, for what's come out this year are Animal Crossing, Doom Eternal, Final Fantasy VII Remake, Ghost of Tsushima, Hades, and The Last of Us Part Two. What do you guys think of that list? Is that a decent enough coverage of what kind of came out this year? Is there maybe some big snuffs? Uh, maybe something I mean, Kingdom Hearts related? Uh, so I don't like Melody of Memory is great, but it's not like Game of the uh. Year at least so far. For me because like mm -hmm. before all the drama with like the last of us came out i would have easily said that because that's the game that had the most like impact on me this this year but i and this is just my own biasy showing but like resident evil 3 isn't on there like um if i had to pick out of that whole list i would probably pick final fantasy 7 remake but even then that's not like game of the year to me when did final fantasy 7 remake come out was that like in february yeah. Uh, it was it, right after, right before, no, it was right after quarantine. Like, it was right after, like, quarantine started. Like, near yeah. April, I think. That feels like a million years ago. Like, I had to stop yeah. thinking, like, wait, did that come out this year? It felt, it feels like it came out a year ago. I, I agree. Mm -hmm. I think, um, I know <clears throat> Animal Crossing isn't necessarily something that I'm into, even though I recognize how much people love it. So well, I have I no issue with that. But personally, I, mean, I was I convinced like for Animal Crossing. <laughs> I mean, I feel like Animal Crossing is there because of the impact that it's had on just people in general. It was literally just like it was it's like what I saw was like Animal Crossing is the game of this year. I was like, you know what, <laughs> yeah. you won me over. That's that's all the argument I needed. <laughs> it's the ultimate good vibe game, right? Yeah, mm -hmm. and the fact that the fact that it came out when it did yeah. was particularly telling. I think it was one of the. It was, Alongside Doom Eternal, it came out right when quarantine started, I think. Mm. Mm -hmm. I think it was like a week or two, which was... I think we might have mentioned it on last episode, but those two games got kind of lucky in that um, they didn't have to deal with COVID as much as other studios that had games released during it. Or, uh, I'm saying... Sorry. Released later on in the year. Like, they only had to adapt a little bit, get over the finish line. Uh, another thing I realized that's not on there, uh, and again, biases, and maybe I'm the only person in the, in the world who considers this game material, material is uh, tell me why. I haven't played that, actually. Personally. To me personally, that's really high up on my game of the year list. And to me, tell me why you got very snubbed, in fact, throughout the, all categories. I hmm? think the... 
Like, tell me why it isn't really... It's only in, I think, one category. It's... I think it's only in games... Games for Change, which I, I can yeah. understand why it's on there, but at the same time, like, it's mm. not up for, like, best, like, story or anything. Yeah. But honestly, I thought its story was extremely well done. I, I feel like people forgot it existed this this year, which is just yeah. really sad. I think the only reason I would say... I, I don't want to say the word, the word deserves, but just for lack of a better word for this context, I think the only reason why it doesn't, air quote, deserve to be on the game of year, the year list, because that story isn't complete. I believe it's only the first two episodes are out. No, everything's, no, no, everything's out. out. No, is every... Okay, no, yeah, never mind. It's, it's three episodes, okay. it's three parts, right? It's three parts and it's all yeah. out, right? Yeah, okay, it I'm, came I'm... out, they released week after week after week. It, it wasn't like a... Mm. Life this is Strange like 2, where it was like months. No, this came out like week after week after week. Okay, damn. Mm-hmm. Yeah, <laughs> so like yeah, a like lot of fun. <laughs> yeah, like the like the Game Awards forgot a lot of games. This like like you completely since um since it since uh, it came out it came out after the cutoff last year. It, this year, well, only one instance of uh, uh, Fallen Order, which I feel yeah, like deserves yeah. to be in way oh, more yeah, categories. Oh, yeah, that. I, Fallen Order is another game. I forgot that came out this year. I feel like it actually didn't. It came out in uh, December. <laughs> there you yeah, go. but it came out go. the cutoff of the of the Game Awards. So I feel like that's just so unfair to it because it's like it's not even on the edge of like um, mm-hmm. of gaming discourse because because everyone in their mind just like yeah, 2019. Let's not even bother thinking mm-hmm. about it. It's so. really unfair. It got really unlucky, and I love that game. I picked, it over Death, I picked it over yeah. Death Stranding, and I'm really glad I, p- I made that choice. <laughs> Among Us is nominated for stuff when that game came out, like, what, years ago? Mm-hmm. Yeah, like, like ago. two, three years ago? Uh, yeah, eight, uh, so 2018, it's like, yeah. It's, I don't know, because it's, like, at least in my personal opinion, not many, like, crazy big things have come out to make you, like, forget everything that came out at the beginning of the year. Mm-hmm. And it's, like... I fact think that, that about Fallen Order, forget about stuff like tell me, tell me why. But then you have to remember that not many places reviewed tell me why. If you look at like different review outlets, not many places did. Yeah, it also it just seems to have gone under a lot of people's radars just generally. It's a shame it's on Game Pass too. So <laughs> if you already have that service, it's it. It's completely free on Game Pass. Mm-hmm. So it's I I don't know just well, I, yeah. I feel like it's, for for what it's worth so underwhelming to me I'm just gonna watch to see what they reveal for next year. For what it's worth, I have not played. Uh, tell me why, but I am a huge fan of Don't Nod's previous work. Um, probably probably a bigger fan of Life is Strange two over the two previous ones. I still need um, to play Life is Strange, Strange one too. and uh, what what was the in between one before the uh, yeah. before the storm and before then the storm. before. I feel like people. The funny thing is, I oh, feel like Captain people. Spirit, people right? Captain Spirit, yeah, that was sort of a mid qual. And then the the one the donut game that people always tend to sleep on is Remember Me, which I think gets a bad rep. I I, I enjoyed it. It was uh, it, the I irony kind of, of that name. Yeah, the, the irony is not lost <laughs> on me either. They had difficulty finding a publisher for it, apparently. But no, I just think this entire award thing this year is incredibly underwhelming. Like, again, I'm not really caring about the awards more than I'm caring about, like, what they're going to uh, announce or what they're Mm -hmm. rumored to announce, to be honest. Like, I I can honestly care less about what wins stuff right now. I haven't haven't played Hades, but I would say the obvious weak link on the on this list so far is probably Ghost of Tsushima. Like oh, I, I, yes. I love that game, but yes. it is basically I mean, just a very that. good Assassin's Creed game. Yeah, it's, yeah. Not, it's phenomenal. not quite game of the year material. It's one of those games where I would call it a solid 8 out of 10 in the sense that it's a great game, but I would not rank it among my best. I have played that one too. Oh. And it's, it's like somebody... Games so- are out of 10. It's like somebody took Assassin's Creed, to your point, and just put an incredibly beautiful set of shaders on it. It's an incredible-looking game, but it didn't leave much of an impact on me beyond that. I I think what it comes down for me, at least, um, because we're going to be doing our own Game Awards, we have our own categories and whatnot, we're going to be debating that live, so if you have any question behind the logic of what we pick, 
you can uh, stay tuned live to see how that kind of uh, horribly unfolds. I have the most important category, which is hottest, hottest fictional dude of twenty of uh, twenty twenty, including the super shotgun from Doom's Eternal. Oh, you just added that, but it, it's a very have important. Have you seen it? And you decided. So, close, close wins besides Zagreus. Uh, first of all, that's not a wrong answer. It's <laughs> not a wrong. <laughs> Granted, I thought he was hot way back when they announced this game. Even I like Zagreus. Come on, years ago. When I was just like, hey, this game's fun. No one else is playing it but like me and like five other people who have Epic Games Store accounts. But yeah, just going back to Ghost of Tsushima, like when I think about it, it's like it's a very good jack of all trades. But when I think of things that excel in one category, like I look at Doom Eternal, I'm just like, that's the best shooter of this year, if if not the entire generation. And then Last of Us has one of the best stories of this generation, if if not all games. Well, I look at Ghost of Tsushima, it's just like, yeah, as uh, as Nitro said, it's it's basically an 8. It's a very good 8, but just kind of in the middle. Yeah, like, because I think it's like there are games where you consider great that there, that there are games that are, wow, that's great. And there are games where it's like borderline 7, almost, if that makes mm. any sense. Swimming in 7s. Mm-hmm. Though, I can... So I, I can enjoy a 7 or 8 out of 10 more than they can enjoy a 10 out of 10. I'll tell you that for free. <laughs> but so yeah, we're, we're going to be doing our own, uh, not awards show, but we'll be we'll be discussing like the categories, what we believe we'll go in. We'll, we'll have fun with it. It's going to be mm-hmm. a big chaotic mess, and it'll be beautiful. And uh, so that should be coming, maybe not next week, because we do have to narrow down the list, and we need everyone on in order to mm-hmm. um, to argue will, for what they believe uh, should be must, on there. I must say, I want, I want to say something about the Game Awards. Oh yeah, go ahead. Uh, is that they, they they hate the FGC, and they are constantly <laughs> making fun of us every time. <laughs> having, having, um... Let me let me get to the list. Yeah, here it is. Yeah, One Punch Man, a hero nobody knows in best fighting game is so rude. <laughs> it's so frustrating. For those that don't know, uh, Mason is uh, a resident uh, fighting game expert. You, you want to give us the laydown of that specifically and why that was a bad decision? Uh, well, I guess because there's always... I guess every year there's always a 3D arena anime fighter. And they're always bad, and <laughs> <laughs> and no one plays them, and they're and they're, they're terrible. And they and for some reason, people who don't play fighting games always lump them into fighting games when really they honestly belong closer in family than they do in fighting games. So would it's you say basic, Would you say basically the only reason that's made it on the list is because they're like, uh, oh, it's a fighting game that got on there, and yeah, people, that came out this year and people bought it. Mm-hmm. That sucks. <laughs> I mean, the rest, the rest, the rest, the rest of it's fine. The rest of it's fine. I believe there is a Gundam fighting game that came out this year that apparently was really, really good. That, that I, mean, I remember seeing a lot of people were disappointed that it wasn't nominated. But besides that, um, on the the category is better this year than most years. I, I think at this point for our fighting game. Uh, category. We're just gonna name it with the subtitle Mesa's fighting game category <laughs> because I, I think mean, you might be the only one that's actively that's 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 active in that community. I can only talk about Guilty Gear, and that's it. I can only if this if this were last year, I could talk about Smash Brothers Ultimate. Then I could talk I could talk for the entire time. <laughs> <laughs> M- well, we- Mesa. Are you talking about M- Mobile Suit Gundam Extreme versus Maxi Boost On? That's a name I for a game. I think so. I believe that's <laughs> it. Yeah, that's like Sad a Kingdom Hearts name. name. But yeah, I think I think I think it made some waves in in uh, a in uh, anime fighting game Twitter. It doesn't even look like it came out in America though. Uh-huh. From what I'm seeing, I can only find like you 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 have to import a. Asian territory copy because that has English s- subtitles in it. Huh. That's yeah. So I mean, I can maybe understand why that wasn't nominated. Yeah, that, that's the case, and yeah, that's fair. Um, yeah, like you, you you have to import it to play it. So 
I mean, don't even... but, Yeah, that's huh? fair. How do you feel about Watch Dogs Legions? Yay or nay? I oh, mean, I'm playing that I'm... too. Yeah, I mean, I'm I'm actually enjoying it. I mean, I took a break from it because I was getting Ubisoft open world fatigue for a while, and I was like, I'm gonna like back up yeah. for like a couple weeks. But I'm enjoying it. It's like surprising me in ways I didn't think it would. So, so why? <laughs> in general, would you, would you say yay or nay? Thumbs yay. Thumbs down. All right. What do you think about turfs? I don't like turfs. I didn't yay, hear yay, about yay this. or nay. Big nay, right? Nay. <laughs> Uh, Ubisoft has taken steps to fully replace a transphobic, controversial Good. voice actor, <laughs> Helen Lewis, from Watch Dogs Legion's in-game podcast after becoming aware of the performer's steeped history and bigotry. Uh, Ubisoft's official stance on it is that they were ignorant of it. They didn't do any background research into those statements. Uh, Lewis's statements come from a 2017 op-ed from The Times, which The Times maybe don't let people use your platform to... To spread shit like this. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, in her op-ed, she puts, A man can't just say he has turned into a woman. Obviously, a transphobic mm. comment. And uh, is met with wide derision from the gaming community. And she's been widely and accurately been labeled as a turf. And yeah, I'm happy to see this person stripped away from the game. I, I, no one who's a bigot should have a place in games. I don't care. Strip them out. Replace them. I mean, I feel really bad saying that I probably wasn't paying attention to the podcast that she was on it in the game because I was listening to like my own podcast while I was playing the game. So it wasn't yeah, the podcast kind of suck. But it's like at the same time, I mean, I'm not like defending people here, but I can understand if they didn't look up background checks on just like a background voice actress that's in there for like a whole ten minutes on like a thing that no one's going to hear. But at the same time, I'm glad that Ubisoft stepping up and being like, okay, we're fucking phasing her out or switching it with someone else like at least they're actually doing something about it yeah though i must admit it always feels like they're doing something about it and never stopping it before they need (laughs) to do something about it (laughs) it's it's like making mistakes it's like making mistakes is fine but you gotta learn from you can't just keep fucking Mm -hmm. yeah like sorry did it again my bad yeah and i know that See, the thing is, I know people are understandably very upset at Ubisoft right now. I, th- I think the sad thing is that this is probably one of the least, less controversial incidents associated with them. But to their credit, and I'm not inclined to give Ubisoft credit lately, uh, you know, they realized it. They, they offered what I think is a very sincere apology, and they replaced her. So what, whether or not, you know, they, they, they always commit to doing better. Whether or not they will, uh, we'll see what happens. But yeah, in, in this in- instance, I think uh, the appropriate action was taken. So more power in, to them. I think I'm in full mm-hmm. agreement with that. They've taken steps mm-hmm. to um, to uh, to remove people from the company, even higher ups, including Chief Creative Officer. Uh, I'm gonna fucking butcher these names so bad. <laughs> Officer French Canadian names. Officer Serge Haskiot, Global Head of Human Resources, Cecile Cornet, uh, Assassin's Creed Valhalla Creative Director, the, the game that just came out. Um, Ashraf Ismail, uh, Marketing Manager Andrian. How Don't even attempt that last what? name. Don't even. Don't even bother. Even, yeah, it's, I, nobody would blame you. <laughs> but uh, all these people have had. Uh, I've had sexual harassment allegations or just like toxic workplaces and that and um, like, yeah, they've been properly uh, excised from the company. But well, you also um, have to remember that some of them left on their own accord, meaning they still have stock in the company and they're still profiting, also, like, off they're of still it. profiting off of games and everything, which is utterly gross. But I mean, again, not defending pe- people. I just like to look at the, not the benefit of the, of the doubt, but I like to look at the fact that people are actually working at changing things and the fact that they're getting rid of people and the fact that they're openly, like, trying to change, I think. Like, yeah, I'm not giving them the benefit of the doubt either, but stuff's at least happening. It's not like they're trying to, like, sweep this all up under the rug. At least stuff is happening. So yeah. I, I think Nitro put it pretty succinctly in just that um, they're correcting their mistake. They've come out, they've apologized, they're rectifying it, and just they need to learn from it. And obviously you can't just, like, uproot all this out from like a giant worldwide company like it's going to take time but Mm -hmm. um they just need to be more mindful about it going forward and then we're going to talk about 
the fact that there's a thing in the new Assassin's Creed that apparently says that Desmond Miles caused COVID. <laughs> Wait, what? <laughs> what? <laughs> I don't know spoilers for Assassin's Creed Valhalla's modern day stuff, I guess, but they imply that Desmond mm. Miles was the cause of COVID. Explain who Desmond Miles is real quick. Oh, uh, wait, not, for okay, those wait, like, what? Not. No, I, I know who Desmond Miles is. Oh, okay. For people that aren't away. Don't judge. <laughs> so, I, uh, okay, so the first yeah, couple of Assassin's Creed games followed Desmond, who is this like random Desmond. Random dude who just happened to be like in this like bloodline of really big uh, assassins and stuff. And he ended up being, or was going to be, the harbinger of the apocalypse, but he ended the apocalypse instead. So he's dead now. Like, Desmond's not here anymore. But supposedly um, him ending the apocalypse? What? Okay, I haven't played Assassin's Creed in, like, since, like, Syndicate. He wasn't even a part of Syndicate. Kind of? I, what's he? I don't remember. At this <laughs> point, they... I'm sorry, go ahead, go ahead. Nitro. I was just gonna say, so Desmond's, um... I don't, I'm getting into massive AC Valhalla spoiler territory right now. Mm -hmm. yeah, okay, yeah, so never mind then. I'm not going to go, go any further. I, I, yeah. All I'll say is that yeah, I, I know Desmond, what Desmond is basically I, yeah. a punchline in the series at this point. <laughs> yeah, I, I think at this point... I don't know how. I don't know how. I think at this point they really just need to say like, yeah, no, we we fucked up on the on the present timeline. Let's just forget that. Let's just make this an anthology series because even in Origins and uh, Odyssey, I'm just like, I don't yeah. care about this. I uh, just put me back in the Animus. I'm not gonna walk around and read these Abstergo documents. I don't care. That was my problem with Origins. Origins was my first AC game since Assassin's Creed Three. That's how. That's oh, how. Wow. Yeah. So it had been a very long time. And I had I, I had gotten gotten over some really bad burnout of the Ubisoft open world formula. I love the idea of a game set in ancient Egypt, so I took took a look at it. And the ancient Egypt section was amazing, but then every so often they would just yank me back into the into the present timeline, and I would just be like, Ubisoft, I don't care about this random <laughs> Lila person. I don't care. Let me go be with Bayek or whatever. Bayek was his name. I, right? Yeah. Yep. I yep, honestly believe the best time that Assassin's Creed has done modern day stuff that wasn't Desmond because I, because I, I was like a teen, I actually loved Desmond. I thought it was really interesting that he had this sort of like background and stuff. Was oh. Assassin's Creed Four where they did it, where it was a video game made by Abstergo, and you're walking through the video game offices and mm -hmm. and, and you could like hack into different offices. I love and, those like, puzzles so much. Weren't they explicitly <laughs> like, all of them? <laughs> I love it. I played AC4 this year too. In Assassin's oh, Creed 4, wasn't wasn't uh, Ubisoft like in game, uh, like a subsidiary of Abstergo? Like, uh, really no. they, they were basically playing a self insert fan fiction role. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Abstergo had this like video game company that, that that they used to like seek out people that had ties to the Assassins. Somehow, I just mm -hmm. <laughs> and I, all I remember is that two people in the lobby talking about CTOS. Yes, there yeah. was like a bunch of. This was the first time that Ubisoft hinted at their like extended universe but where wait, but, their games took place in the same world. And that means Ubisoft has to exist, though. Huh? Because you steal a Ubisoft trailer in Watch Dogs too. I forgot you did. <laughs> so that. <laughs> <laughs> so that means Ubisoft has to be in that world as well. Come back Jesus a week Christ. to where me and me. <laughs> Assassin's Creed is such a mess. Now. Every single oh. game is connected. <laughs> there we go. Anyway, you can you go on. <laughs> mm -hmm. Nitro, have you uh managed? Have you managed to grab a PS5? I have not. I'm definitely going to be getting a PS5 sooner than an Xbox One X. Or Series X. I, I'm getting it's, their names it's, mixed it up already. So yeah, I know. <laughs> but the, the PS5, and I mentioned this before we started the stream, there's just more that I want to play, not just on the PS5, but also on the PS4. So Kingdom Hearts 3, I still need to play that. Persona 5, until dawn, I never played. That's my type of game. Oh, that so, is a good one. Yeah. That, so that is a just, perfect stream yeah, game for you. And this yeah. was a... Yeah, that, yeah, that's a good game to stream, actually. But this is something that's the PS4 had going for them that the Xbox One didn't, at least for me. The The Xbox One was the first console in a while that I really just had no interest in. Just There, there was really nothing on it that I like really wanted to play. So that's kind of led into th those 
when judging between those two consoles, the PS5, I, I don't have it. I'm going to get it maybe after things have calmed down a little, but that's going to be my preference, at least for the near future. Mm-hmm. For what it's worth, you're actually in a good position to go back and revisit a lot of those uh, PS4 games because a lot of yeah. them are on that uh, what is, on is the, it, the uh, PlayStation Plus. Uh, yeah. uh, yep. The PlayStation Plus collection, yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. So they're included with the subscription, but but yeah. even aside from that, like if you're buying them piecemeal, those games are crazy cheap now just because they're yeah. older games. So you and now they're dirt. That's pretty good. Friday. Yeah, you got the freaking PS4 Pro enhancements. You got the PS5 enhancements on top mm-hmm. of it. So you're in a damn good spot. Yeah, I'm glad I waited. I mean, and it's not like my perpetual problem has been I always had this gigantic backlog. So unless it's something that I absolutely no hard holds barred one on day one i just figure you know i can wait yeah you'll, it's there you'll get to it eventually i think that's kind of the point that i've had just how to accept just like don't stress out about it it's there bless you by the way um mesa how 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 or i guess sarah you also have it uh how have you managed to fit your behemoth of a ps5 and would you believe me if if i were to tell you uh it was actually supposed to be much bigger initially I God, I hope not, because this thing's fucking yeah. huge. <laughs> it's as tall as the table my 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 TV's I on. I can't wow. even stand it up sideways because my TV is like I have my TV hung on the wall and it's down too short, so I can't stand the PS5 upwards. I have to sit it down <laughs> sideways. I'm lucky that my uh, the little spot that I put my consoles there's plenty of vertical space, so I kind of lucked out with that. But it is so freaking huge, and it's white with little dorsal fins on the side. And so it's it's not like an eyesore, but it's like it just you just notice it so much because of that. I know it's this may be I know that it was the overall design was met with kind of a mixed reaction, but I like it. I think it's very it stands it stands out, and I think mm-hmm. it's kind of like a very slick looking design, and it's it's different. It it doesn't look just look like a gray box. It's it's got its own design. I like that about it. Or like in person, it looks a lot better. I will say yeah. that. Mm-hmm. Like in person, it looks really slick. I think at so. the end of the day, too, like regardless of uh, <laughs> if people love the design or they hate it, it, it's good marketing for Sony either way. It's got people talking about it. Yeah. But uh, in a recent interview with uh, the Washington Post, uh, Sony senior art director Eugene Morisawa who was behind the design of the PS5, noted that the current design was already considerably shrunken from its initial conception. Oh, my God. And so <laughs> oh, this behemoth was much bigger. <laughs> and um, and they told him, like, yeah, no, we can't, we can't do that. You got to make it a little bit smaller. But basically, the current size is at the bare minimum in order to not produce uh, heat sink issues or to produce a jet engine uh, wine. Oh, but like, wait, if it was bigger, it could have fit more tiny Astrobots in it. That That's true. That's true. I think, I think, don't quote me on this, I think the physically biggest uh, home video game console is the Atari 5200. I think. Don't quote me on that. In my uh, mind, it is the original Xbox because you could kill someone with that. that. Series X yeah. is a monolith. It's very big. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but the, the original Xbox One was a VCR. Like if you it drop really that was. on someone's head, they're they're gone. <laughs> it's funny. I still remember thinking that the the original PlayStation Three. Uh, I still remember that being affectionately dubbed the Fat Station because it looked like a giant <laughs> piano almost. Mm-hmm. And now it, it's almost quaint by comparison compared to the PS Five. I would have taken the PS Three size any day of the week. <laughs> Oh yeah, but, compared uh, to the PS5. But honestly, I'm I'm more than happy with the uh, PS5 design because um, so what I had a launch day PS4 and then I got the Pro and both of those just had crazy freaking uh, uh, coil wine issues where it's just screaming at me. I can't play Doom without like a it's not ear piercing, but it's it's annoying enough because I'm sitting close to my console just for how my setup is. Right. And uh, mm. it's just, just like, well, damn, I really don't want to play games on my PS4. I'm just going to buy them on my PC or my Xbox where I, I'm not dealing with this. So mm. it's nice to play some on a PlayStation console and not being screamed at the whole time. Mm. I'm So a couple times my PS5 has sounded like a jet engine. Weirdly enough... Wait, your PS5? Sex. <laughs> Yeah, there's like a few times while I was playing 
bug stacks at my PS5. Yeah. Like, and I was like, are you okay? Maybe it's protesting <laughs> your uh, your war crimes against those bug snacks. I was like, is there too many snacks on the screen? Are you okay? <laughs> but it's like, the one thing I will say is how crazier these bigger consoles have gotten of how, how quieter they are. Like, my Xbox makes no damn noise. Like, mm-hmm. my Series X can run Gears 5 at like 60 F- FPS and it literally is silent. It does mm-hmm. get hot though. Like, it will, like, kind of, like, get hot at the top. I feel like I can, like, roast an egg on it. <laughs> if I get really lucky, I just, like, go like this over it. I could, like, roast an egg. But, yeah, the PS5 is so far been quiet. There's just been times when it'll just, the disk drive will start to run, and it'll be like, e-. Are you using the disk drive? Yeah. Oh, I, yeah, I have I mean, the disk model. I, I did... six And, uh, Godfall. I, uh, okay. I bought a Legion... Uh, a couple days ago because it was half off at Best Buy. Okay. Uh, I've so. only been playing digital games, so I, I guess, yeah, that would make sense that you're hearing a bit of noise specifically for that. Yeah, I feel like it's the disk drive, but then again, it weirdly got loud while I was doing bug snacks. Which- yeah, that's weird. I, I never, it never, it never, it never got audible for me during bug snacks. <laughs> again, so I don't know if there's just too many snacks on my screen or what. <laughs> it just was like, and I'm like, you good? You okay? <laughs> Well, you know um, what? I am very glad you have received your console, Sarah, because... Uh, I did! And it- I didn't get to tell, tell people I got it. A very... I don't want to name him to, like, out him, but a very good friend <laughs> of mine sold it to me. He ended up not needing it, and I got it. So I got one. It is safe here. I'm looking at it right now. And I am done. I am saved. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm all good. Uh, these are not so fortunate in an unfortunate turn of news. Uh, the completely benevolent overlord and savior of the human race, uh, Amazon slash Jeff Bezos, <coughs> has uh, sent a slew of emails to a number of customers informing them that the plastic ambrosia... Why the fuck did I write that? That is so pretentious. I Holy was looking shit. at it, yeah. <laughs> Damn. What the fuck was I thinking? <laughs> anyway, their Xbox Series X's will remain out of their... God, oh, why did I write that? I mean, you and I went to the same film school, but no one ever used the word ambrosia when I you was You know what? It. Dude, I got exclusively A pluses on my papers, and this is exactly I mean, how I wrote it. I never used the word ambrosia. <laughs> I was I was listening to a lot of Alisana, okay? Nice. But, uh, <laughs> uh, fuck, okay, ignoring my writing here. I, I, I need to keep my news article writing very separate from my show notes. <laughs> writing. Those are two very different things. <laughs> Um, fuck. Let's just go from the top. Amazon has sent out emails to those that have oh, that have pre-ordered Xbox Series Xs, and uh, saying sorry, you might get them as late as December thirty first, which would be. So, are uh, these new pre pre-orders or are these no, the older ones? These are the original pre-orders that from back in. Because I got mine day one. You are very lucky, then. You got lucky. <laughs> Like, I got mine day one, and I have friends who also ordered from Amazon who got theirs either day one or around day day one. So I don't know what the fuck they're doing. <laughs> Corporate overlord uh, Jeff Bezos shines upon you. <laughs> He's blessed you with Prime. Ew, I don't want Jeff Bezos <laughs> to fuck me with anything. <laughs> if if you buy an Amazon gift card, why don't they just call it, like, Bezo Bucks? Don't give them any ideas. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I we, we can talk about this later when we discuss what we're playing, but I'm pr- playing Outer Worlds right now, and I'm pretty convinced at this point that the writers from Obsidian just looked at Amazon and were like, "Yeah, that." That'll, that'll be Amazon that in like five years. Mm-hmm. <laughs> just no, yeah, it doesn't make any sense to me because Amazon seemed really on top of it when I pre-ordered my X X Xbox. They were able to let me know when it was shipping out, when I was going to be charged. They pretty much knew, so I don't know either. I just got really lucky, and I got in the like first wave to where they were just able to like ship them out with no problem. But it's or it's also showing the fact that Microsoft doesn't have enough consoles. Yeah, it's probably yeah. I mean, I think like, what Amazon might have done in this instance is that they were taking orders without necessarily having that stock, because they assumed that they would be getting more. Hmm. I mean, that, that could sense. Work, but also, like, the fact... Because, like, I don't know. When I called them asking about buy stock, like, all those weeks ago, the person was pretty much able to, like, get a hold and tell me that they hadn't received them yet, but that they got them the next day. Like, it was, like, this weird... 
I don't I don't know. I feel like none of this is the like like yeah, some of this is the shop's fault because they're selling too many pre pre orders. But at the same time, I also feel like a lot of it's more production fault that they're just not making enough, which then could be led back to it's COVID's fault. We don't know. <laughs> just passing mm. the blame on the other thing. <laughs> That's all that's happening right now. <laughs> In a uh, Reddit Ask Us Anything thread, Apex Legends game director Chad Grinier, 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 I'm going to go with the latter, uh, stood firm with the stance that the company refuses to employ crunch practices on the team and that the slower proliferation of content allows for employees to avoid 15 hour workdays. So this kind of came in the face of uh, their fan base saying, You're not releasing content fast enough. Maybe we're losing interest in it because we need new stuff every week, which I think is a bit obviously unsustainable mm -hmm. and uh, I don't think you necessarily need new content that quick in a game. That's a pretty short attention span. Yeah. And um, this kind of just comes on the back of, um, of what, you would, what we had mentioned in previous weeks where uh, crunching is a poor solution to poorly planned production schedules. Um, and even bringing on new people like at the end of a production schedule is less than optimal because people have to be trained in order to like get to know how systems work and whatnot. Um, so people would have to, those hires would have to be brought on at the beginning of production versus at the last method. So I think it's pretty damn commendable that it that um, not Apex uh, to respawn has come mm -hmm. out and said like no we are not going to crunch our employees they're going to work regular days and. They produced nothing but quality for Apex. And they also created my one of my favorite games of all time, Titanfall 2, so I'll give them a pass on and I mean, it uh, literally also everything. Yeah. It also helps that they're making so much money off Apex to where they can hire brand new people. And be like, oh, we can hire more 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 people so that we have more people working so that there's less crunch. Or just we don't have to crunch in general. So, I mean, it definitely helps that they're making money off of it. And I definitely think that this might keep apex going for longer than people think it's going to because it, i feel like when you like throw so much content at something so fast and again i don't want to give credit to ubisoft but i feel like rainbow six siege does this really well in how they space out adding operators where they're not constant like they're not like all the time they're like oh every couple of months we're gonna add like two or more operators in and add more a, a new a new map so people can have time to learn how these characters play and i feel like apex is doing the same thing and I'm not a battle royale person, but I can appreciate any company that says, like, we're not going to crunch people. We don't want to do that. And well, people yeah, also get that they're also not just working on a Apex. They're also doing, like, that VR Medal of Honor. Is it a Medal of Honor? I just it's, barely I remember. They yeah. also made uh, Fallen Order. I, I totally yep. forgot that. Yeah, they also... So it's not just Apex, which then I'm guessing their anti-crunch model also goes to, to like, their other project, projects that are... Yeah. A Apex. I think it's also worth noting that Apex is a free game and like, yeah, you can buy the new characters, you can buy skins, but you can earn all that stuff in game without ever paying a single cent if you just played enough. And so I think for people to be, to constantly be, be demanding new content, just like, yeah, I know you want new stuff, but you're getting a hell of an experience for free, so kind of weigh your priorities on that. And I think it's it's a little sad we're at a point that we're celebrating any studio that declares, oh, we're not going to crunch. But on the other hand, that's really how bad the game industry has gotten. It's as routine mm -hmm. as it is epidemic. And the, the other side of the thing, and we can talk about this a little with Avengers, which I know which we're also going to talk about. The, I get, I'm not, I'm not remotely excusing it, but I get the incentive to crunch on live service games because there are so many of them now and they're all demanding everybody's attention that it's almost like everyone feels the need to put out content as much as possible, as fast as possible. A couple of live service games have admitted that. So it's almost this race and it makes it, it feels sometimes that crunch is not an inevitability, but then it's gonna happen on live service games where you're determined to keep people's attention as long as possible. Right. I think you brought up a good point. Um, good point there also, it's that it feels weird when there's a development studio that comes out and says like, hey, we're going to do the baseline thing that should just be like widespread versus, um, you know, people crunching. So we should it, it should be by default. People should work in normal shifts. It shouldn't right. necessarily mm -hmm. be something to celebrate. But 
when the whole industry is skewed one way, you kind of have to champion what should be normal. And I'm one industry leader. I'm not even going to mention him. Um, and, and you see this a lot from gamers in general, when complaints about crunch are brought up, they just say, Oh, we'll just go get another job. Aside from that, it never being that easy, especially during a pandemic and especially in an industry as competitive as the, as the video game industry. My problem with that is it kind of implies that crunch at some studios is okay, as long as there are alternatives. And if that's how low your bar is, that's a little worrying. Yeah. And the pro- and I think, pro- I mean, at least personally with me, my biggest issue, my biggest, biggest problem with Crunch, besides, you know, obviously the the labor, <laughs> is, um, is the fact that what they're doing is that they're taking advantage of people's love of, yeah. you know, what they're doing, of what they're working. They're, they're, they're basically mining their love for a little extra profit. And then, you know, you left there a shallow husk who's barely slept, who, you know, missed their child's birthday. And, you know, you know what? Screw it. I'm just going to go make, I'm just going to go make a mobile app. And, you know, it's fuck video games and you leave and it's, that's, that's depressing. You'd be yeah. surprised by how many people, um, at least in the Bay Area where we live, um, mm. because there's also plenty of uh, studios here. A lot of people just wind up going to Apple saying like, yeah, I can do less work, work normal hours and make more money at Apple versus mm. working on like admittedly it's something they love which is games which is like why would you put yourself under that much duress i mean th- this is kind of a tech industry issue in general and i know this personally because it is the field i work in where there's a reason why there, there's this controversy about how silicon valley especially is so youth centric w- because it's very easy to convince people in their 20s that working 100 hour weeks is some sort of act of nobility and I'm sure, mm-hmm. and you, I'm sure you see that plenty in the game industry. It's easy to get them into, and I, I say them with me, Mason, Sarah. I'm not sure how old you are. I'm good. Thirty-two. Ah, oh, damn! I was gonna guess. Oh, <laughs> but um, yeah, you know, people in your twenties typically uh, unmarried. Uh, some are mm. in relationships, but typically don't have kids. So, like, yeah, you can drive those people into the ground. Versus, you know, someone who's in their forties who has a mortgage, mortgage, and whatnot. But uh, mm-hmm. yeah, it's a it's a whole big mess. And uh, speaking of uh, unfortunate messes, we're gonna go back to uh, Ubisoft. Uh, they recently uh, went through a a potential hostage situation a few weeks back um, at their what office was this? The Montreal uh, office was, located in Montreal, the Mile End area. Uh, specifically, the office that works on Rainbow Six. Yeah, and so- supposedly. Uh, I like I'm not saying this is true or not, but supposedly uh, people believe the reason why it happened was because the six invitational was supposed to go on just digitally because, you know, of COVID and everything. Mm-hmm. And I'm believing that the SWAT call was called in because people wanted to cancel the M- the invitational and well, because it is... end up canceling it. That is incredibly fucking stupid. And uh, I I think just as a general statement, fuck people who dox, fuck people who swat. And just the general statement, even if it's a company that you don't like, people could have died. Like, people could have legitimately gotten shot and and, and killed, even if it's a fake swatting. Because the the officers go in there, the Montes? Is it the Montes? I don't know. I'm not trying to be offensive. I just don't know if it was the Montes. Um, I'll ask Jeff. (laughs) Jeff, help. Uh, the people going into it, they don't know that it's fake. So they could, they could, of course, people say, oh, it's Canada. It's not like um, America. No, but at the same time, something please, could sir, have please. happened. Well, there was actually a case, um, I want to say, like, what, two, three years ago, where it, that exact thing did happen, where someone got swatted and the officer uh, did did shoot the innocent person. Yeah, it happened. And- it and, it and is, and it is literally. Oh, go ahead. Sorry. No, no, no. Just, just that they shot and killed them. Like, don't yeah, forget. I was just going to say, it, swatting mechanically is attempted murder by cop. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and it's just like because I was seeing, oh god, just the grossest Twitter comments of people hoping that people died and all this gross stuff. I won't mention all because of all the obviously very terrible shit that's been coming out about Ubisoft. That doesn't mean people should fucking die. Like, come on. Come on, guys. People take this shit way too fucking far. And, you know, the thing is, look, 
be upset at Ubisoft as an institution. Absolutely. But, I mean, never mind. Even if you don't go as far as doxing, even if you harass developers on Twitter, Ubisoft developers on Twitter, you're not just being a nasty shithead. You're actively wasting your time because you're taking it out on people who have no say in any of these senior level decisions. And it's just... A lot of these developers were fucked up by this. Anyone yeah. would like there were st there was a bunch of people say saying on Twitter like how shaken up they were and how they weren't coming to work for the next few days. Like understandable. Like you didn't know if there was an actual hostage situation going on. You didn't know if there was a bomb placed placed in your building. Like none of this shit's funny. You shouldn't be wasting ill will on anybody. Yeah. Even as far <laughs> like I'm yeah, sorry. As far as that's yeah, as, as far as they knew, uh, this was a very real threat. There's people locked on the roof for two hours, scared that someone's going to bust down the door and, and gun them all down. And uh, just, just even knowing that, um, uh, fortunately, the Montreal police have since confirmed the hostage situation was a hoax. But the time that they spent up there, scared that they were going to die, that they're not going to see their family. That's real, and that's going to have long-life consequences for those employees. And thankfully, yeah. uh, Ubisoft as a company is providing uh, free psychological services to the affected employees. Like and, it's, uh, and, and if and if it was true, if this was all done just to cancel like a, like an online game tournament, like come on, guys, be and this is dumb saying this, I know, but just be fucking adults, please. Like, I just I like, don't understand it. Like it's it's mind blowing to me just all the hate that was coming out of this. I think even going back to what we were saying about crunch is um, for for programmers, for developers, uh, this is just another reason why a lot of people leave the gaming industry. It's, it's an yeah. extremely toxic community. It's a lot of mm -hmm. you don't have to deal with this shit if you're just working on getting the new iOS version working on iPhones. You don't yeah. have to deal with this shit. It's fucking ridiculous. Especially if you're on the front lines. Like I remember... Um, during, when the CDPR delay was announced, just shifting gears for a second, I remember one of the social media managers said that the threats they got in YouTube comments were particularly brutally nasty. And knowing what I know about YouTube comments, I that the idea of particularly bad YouTube comments just makes my skin crawl. So not, not even just design. I mean, if you work in marketing or communications and just don't want to deal with that anymore, how could I possibly blame you? I mean, I will never forget, again, off tangent, but really quick, when I attended GDC last year, no, yeah, GDC, I was very lucky to attend GDC last year, and I was basically going to, like, you know, resumes and stuff, and I had spoken to a social media manager at a big company that I will not mention, because I remember the company, hmm. and I was like, oh, I'm interested in social media work, which I am, and she looks me in the eyes, she goes, you don't want to do this, she's like, this is absolute hell. Hmm. <laughs> She's like, it's most likely you don't have the back backbone for it, and I'm going to tell you now to not do it so that you don't get hurt. Like, she was just beating down any, any interest that I had, which I still have interest in it. She didn't beat it down completely, but, like, she beat down any interest that I had in it. And I was just like, is this really the way to get people hired, just to, like, tell them not to do something? Because if you don't, because if you're telling me not to do it, why are you doing it? I think for so many people, it's it's that passion for loving what they do, mm -hmm. and it's like you you, I, I don't want to say you, you, well no, you shouldn't accept that status quo. You should push back against it. But like, pragmatically speaking, it's like yes, this industry does face so much more bullshit than other similar industries that people are uh, trained for. So it's it's a whole fucking mess. Uh, yeah. Mesa, how, how you? I think you're. Or I'm sorry. I might. Uh, next, not next. God damn it. <laughs> Nitro, have you have you played Avengers whatsoever? I have, and uh, I, I'm not I'm not sure if you're asking me for my feedback, but just to kind of set the stage here, yeah, I have played it. Okay, and uh, Mesa, mm -hmm. you've also you played it a bit towards launch. Have you kept up with it whatsoever? I mean, I've played I've played it. Um, I've taken a little break and waiting for Kate Bishop to come out, which is on the eighth. So um, you know, I'll I'll, pro I'll start playing it again. I've already have it re reinstalled on my PS5. Um. Yeah, it's just, like, it's sad to see what's happening, but I un I completely understand why it's happening, and, like, like this in is... In, in reference to what's <laughs> happening, it's, um, 
it's despite their fault. its two point two million launch month sales, uh, Square Nexus Avengers is facing a uh, rapidly dwindling player base, specifically on the PC version, which has lost ninety six percent of its player base since its launch back in September. Um, I think but- also that Destiny had their new expansion come out, and I feel like mm-hmm. Avengers are like aiming towards the Destiny crowd. A little bit. Yeah, those, yeah. those are kind of the same demographics, yeah. 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 And the. Uh, and th- except I like playing Avengers and don't like playing Destiny. So. <laughs> <laughs> and just to and just to provide some context here, I've actually I've got Steam Steam open in front of me right now. As we speak, there are one thousand two hundred eighteen people in game. Okay, that's actually a little bit more than this report I have. Um, mm-hmm. That's a lot. It's not the, that uh, many. The, the height of player activity peaked early in November with uh, 1,190 players, so a little bit lower than what um, Nitro just quoted, uh, with the average for the month uh, amassing at 752. So that's just the <laughs> overall average. And uh, just, again, for some additional context, uh, that doesn't even crack the top 100 games on Steam, what Avengers yeah. is pulling in even right now. For that kind of budget of marketing and, and j- the fucking IP, that is... Yeah. Uh, mm. That's pretty sad. It's and, really, uh, yeah, they just haven't put out content. It's just so frustrating. That's that was my problem with it. I mentioned that I had played it. I have not kept up with it. I just fe- I very I, very little about it appealed to me. That it was just for me. It was just one big game of eh. Like the combat was eh. Progression was eh. There's it just it just felt like the the game was just going through the motions for me. I, I, I never even jumped in because I heard, oh, it's like Destiny. You get loot. I'm just like, I'm out. I'm good. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but uh, as for f- uh, the reasons behind the uh, dwindling player base, I, I would attribute it to a couple key factors being uh, the PC port in particular is is not a great port. It had a lot of issues, uh, in counting, including numerous crashes for a lot of players. Um, just overall, the game did not have great reviews across the board. And uh, Sony kind of nabbed the majority of the player base thanks to uh, gaining ex- exclusive rights to Spider-Man. So none of the other platforms uh, will have access to Spider-Man. I think, Mesa, isn't that specifically the reason you got it on PlayStation? Yeah. Absolutely. Spider- Spider-Man's got pool, dude. Oh, Spider-Man uh, will pull so, me any day. So I just was curious and I looked up what the most played game is on Steam currently with like current players and wallpaper engine is beating Avengers by like twenty nine yeah. fair. <laughs> and then, wallpapers. And then just to get yeah, it's fascinating look at the Steam data. Avengers right now has less con- concurrent players than the original Counter Strike. Wow. Also <laughs> Yu Gi Oh dual link. So I mean, you know. Yeah. Uh... So. Oh well. Anyway, continue. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I know. This is uh, one in particular that uh, Nitro is uh, eager to discuss. Is everyone familiar with the entire Epic Games v. Apple lawsuit? And I, um, I just know that Epic Games yep. is very gross. <laughs> right, yep. For, for um, those, so for I guess those in in stream that uh, aren't aware, um, Epic Games the. Uh, the company behind Fortnite is having a bit of a, a little bit of a tussle with Apple because they broke their contract with Apple on their mobile platforms to uh, to allow players to purchase the in-game currency via third-party websites, thus circumventing the thirty percent cuts that that they're con- that they are contractually obligated to get uh, via by using that platform, and so. Epic very explicitly broke it. So they had a whole PR plan going with a full-on uh, satire of uh, what was it, Apple's 1984 yeah. video mm-hmm. for the, for Macintosh. Yep. They kind of weaponized their very young fan base into being like, "Fuck Apple, you pieces of shit!" Like we we're going against this monopoly, despite the fact that you knew the terms when you signed the contract, and you're already a super crazy huge company. I mean, so it just kind of reads his greed. I mean, I I don't necessarily agree with the, the initial Apple stuff either. I think that maybe, you know, since it is a, a since their platforms are a bit of a walled garden, I think it might be a little little much. Um 
Well, what's funny is that um, Microsoft was also having issues with Apple because Apple's not mm-hmm. allowing Game Pass on their platform. <laughs> And um, yeah, so Microsoft cloud. has so Microsoft has that incentive for backing uh, Epic's case, but at the same time, Xbox does the exact same so, fucking thing on their console. Like every game that's sold mm-hmm. on Xbox, they get a percentage from developers. Well, yeah, but I mean, but like you know, like like let's not forget like the fact that the same thing this how ha- also happened on the Google Play Store the exact same day, but it's not that big of a deal because you can just download Fortnite anyway, because it's because it's the Android. You can just you can just do that. On on Apple, you you have to go through the App Store. Yeah, I mean, I'm I don't mm-hmm. think that necessarily changes my my stance on it. No, but I mean, like you know, one of the things that Epic has been doing has been, you know, been not I, I don't want to say fighting because that implies a uh, um some sort of like valor to what they're doing when you know it's just it's it's a business doing a business, right? Um, but you know, they, corporate. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, but they've been, um, you know, pushing for um, lower... Like, one of the reasons why the Epic Game Store has been doing what it's doing is because it's, 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 it's trying to convince, like, other retailers, like, like Steam, to lower their cut um, from, from games. I think that's like, all the... fine and, and dandy. Like, mm-hmm. in, uh, I think later on in the story, uh, Apple had recently... Um, they, they've decreased the uh, payment processing mm-hmm. fees from 30 I believe, to 15 yep. for small um, developers that don't make a million dollars a year. So, in effect, like, that. yes, that, that's a good that's a good move for small developers. <laughs> but as far as, like, Epic itself, I'm just like, I, I, I see what that posturing has achieved in that sense. Mm. But it, it still just screams of, like, a corporation just, just wants more money. And I'm just like, Ep- I don't care. Yeah. Well, yeah, is, but you you but you are arguing. Oh, this corporation wants more money. No, this corporation wants more money. You know. I am loyal to my <laughs> corporate overlords. <laughs> <so. laughs> well to that. But yeah, that, that's the thing that people are are forgetting here. Epic is doing this primarily to benefit itself. Yes. Uh, and anything positive that happens is a byproduct of that. And I'm saying I'm not a fan of Apple. I'm not any kind of white knight for Apple here. They have plenty of their own issues we can talk about. And I think the way that Epic has handled this especially has been tasteless, to put it very mildly. I think in a year, in the year 2020, where authoritarianism is a very serious issue, uh, portraying your struggle as being like equivalent with Orwellian, even if it was a parody of Apple's ad, is a little tasteless at the very best it, it's full-on propaganda like especially yeah. with their mm-hmm. with their player base who, who don't know what the fuck 1984 is who they don't know that what the point of uh that they original apple alive. commercial was they weren't alive when it and came out you know what it's not just the fact it's they not had that, was fact either, but... they had that hashtag ready to go too like in the yeah. video yeah because kind of they knew it was gonna happen they knew it was gonna happen it was ready the the day that um, Fortnite got taken off. Like this was all planned. This what this didn't yeah. come out like a week later. This was the same day. Yeah, and you know it's not just the fact that Epic has what bas- has basically openly weaponized a hu- tried to weaponize a huge audience of very young fans into a private army. It's the fact that, and we've had d- discussions like this, and mm. we in SDGC all the time. Game publishers have been accused of being very silent as their most loyal fans have attacked critics, have attacked people who have criticized the games. Uh, and and Epic now has basically just come out and admitted it, that, yeah, we're, ha- we're happy to take advantage of our own fandom mm-hmm. and basically weaponize them. And to me, I think the worst part about this is that none of this is going to have any impact on the lawsuit. Mm-hmm. All of this posturing and riling their fan base up into a hyena-like frenzy it's not going to matter because everything is going to be decided in a series of courtrooms far away from all of this. Mm-hmm. Yeah, th- this whole Absolutely. situation is just such a giant so, mess, and I, I I feel no no empathy or sympathy for either party. Just mm-hmm. as as much as like of a headache that Epic has mm-hmm. given me for this. Though, I, I, um, I don't want to um, be like shielding Apple. Just like no, don't do anything bad to Apple. It's just like yeah, I I think just Epic is. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it, it's in, a headache. In favor of you know Epic's argument, I must admit it is a little unfair that you know Hulu, Netflix, Amazon Prime, 
all of these companies, you pay outside of Apple, outside of their service. Apple doesn't get a cut. However, those apps are just fine on the App Store. That is also true. Yeah. It's, it's just it's, so in that sense, it is arbitrary where they do draw mm. that line. I'm not I'm not too I, sure I, about like the that deals are like, like like you can say like even on your mm-hmm. Xbox. I don't trust does the motivation. Xbox, does Xbox like get any profits whatsoever whatsoever from like Netflix being on there? Mm. Hell yeah. However, the selfish motivations I do actually do agree with uh, most of Epic's uh, assertions um, about you know uh, that the, that that the App Store is unfair. And I think that that move that Apple did to to bring down the price of fifteen percent is a, such a such a humongous step, at least in my pers- my perspective. That like, if if that if that's all that comes out of this, then this was positive. This this was great. For what it's worth, I think you're absolutely right, and that like, yeah, the the status quo on Apple is unfair. But mm-hmm. uh, I I guess I'm still just by the stance of like. You can think it's unfair, but if you go into that contract accepting that, you can't cry fell and then break it and then wonder why bad things are happening to you when you consciously broke the contract that you went into. I'm fine well, just... with with Epic fighting Apple to like lower the price of how much Apple gets. I'm not okay with them weaponizing children to do it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, I think there's uh, one part we can all agree on. Uh, during a conversation hosted by the New York Times uh, Dealbook Summit, Epic Games CEO Tim Sweeney commented on the company's ongoing lawsuit against Apple, stating that accepting the 3% payment processing fees is the same as colluding with Apple to restrain competition, but the uh, bigger headache comes on from... Uh, Sweeney went on to equate his already astronomically successful company struggles as parallel to the civil rights movement stating no! and there and, and, let me just restate that for those that didn't mm. hear he uh, equated epic's whole struggle with apple as a uh, parallel to the civil rights movement you know that that big old thing mm-hmm. that was trying to uh exactly. by any means necessary. create some yeah, equality exactly. he gets it he, he states uh, there were actual law or i'm sorry he says uh, and there were actual laws that were wrong, and people disobeyed them, and it was not wrong to disobey them, because to go along with them would be collusion to make them status quo. That's in uh, context of speaking against why the civil rights movement was justified, just because um, the laws were against people, it, it was not morally wrong to go against them because the laws were wrong. But j- that is just such a bad fucking that that is such a blatantly stupid putting mm-hmm. your foot in your mouth statement yeah. like, Why? Oh, it is, and, mm-hmm. yeah and then he, then he did an established and, legal tactic sorry yeah go, go ahead i was gonna say that's an established legal tactic of breaking your contract and then arguing that the contract shouldn't have been this in the first place that's where an established legal legal tactic so i don't yeah he's just he's dumb and he also he did that twitter thing where he said the thing he got a huge amount of backlash for it, and then he started doubling down, basically saying, oh, I was taken out of context, which is now shorthand for, oh, you said something I don't like, so let me re- try to recontextualize the argument. He did that thing where he just started basically retweeting everyone who was agreeing with him. It's like, Tim, dude, you said something stupid, okay? It's it's fine. You can admit that. I, I, I want to give him the benefit of the doubt, because it's like, I don't think he legitimately believes like these two are equivalent. But it is just such a stupid fucking thing to say. And like and especially when people are looking at your company just like, uh, you're being a little bit a bit, bit of a greedy company there, like regardless of of uh, people's different opinions on that. Like that, mm-hmm. that that's some of the perspective that people have. And then you add this on top of it, you're just like that that's not good, dude. Yeah. Uh, has anyone been playing Yakuza Seven? I know if Blaine were here, she she'd be uh, no. chalking this up. Mm-hmm. I have a I have a good friend that just beat it. Nice. I uh, have not played it. I'm a huge fan of the the Yakuza series, though, so it's it's on the list. I was uh I was very surprised to learn that uh, up until eleven months before its Japanese release, uh, Yakuza Seven was planned to be uh, kind of a regular entry in the series where it's a beat 'em up. But for an April 1st video they, they put out last year, I, I'm assuming, I'd have to look at the dates. Um, the studio behind it, uh, Ryuga, I, 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 I aced Japanese in, a, in a, my first semester of community college. I don't, I'm bad at it now, forgive me. 
the development studio released a video showcasing uh, the new titles of Radical Shift from the JRP into the JRP genre. So it was a it was an April Fool's joke. They're just like, oh, ha ha, Yakuza is a JRPG now. But they actually got so much critical acclaim from that. People were excited, like, oh wow, we're actually excited. Let's let's bring the series into a new direction. And the development studio looked at what was supposed to just be a dumb little throwaway joke. They went, oh, uh, we need to change the fundamentally every aspect of the combat in this game right now. So in the last 11 months of development, they actually managed to turn it around, which in of itself is pretty damn amazing. But the fact that the game came out as good as it does, as a tested mm-hmm. by uh, Blaine's commentary yeah. from last episode, I think that's pretty damn commendable and pretty damn crazy. I really need I to play think it. I just think it's so amazing. The Yakuza, the, the Yakuza series in general, it has a quality bar that I think most development studios and publishers would absolutely kill for. It seems that uh, the seventh game now has been receiving rave reviews from what I've been seeing from other fans. I've now, I don't know how many all of you have played. I've played Kiwami, I've played three, and I've played four. All of them have been have been wonderful. The, so, uh, the only one I haven't played yet is six. I'm, I'm That is currently installed on my PS5. Okay. But uh, I really need to jump into this, mm-hmm. and um, that, I, I that my my friend who's a y- large Yakuza franchise, for, like six, made him cry. Like he, <laughs> oh, no. like six is gonna. <laughs> I hope you're ready. It's crazy how much love uh, the studio has been getting, and and I, I want to say like most of that's coming from how how good of an entry point zero was. But uh, with the English voice acting, I know specifically, is actually drawing in a lot more uh, Western audiences for uh, for Yakuza Seven. So I'm just glad to see the franchise kind of get the love that it deserves. It's, it's uh, so fun. It's so funny because I've been playing this. I remember the original PS2 voice acting for Yakuza Mark One. Hamill's Majima, oh best. my god! And it's. It's so fun. I, I'd forgotten. I went back and looked at it, and it's so funny, especially after playing Kiwami. It's like, hello, Majima-san. My name is Kiryu-san. I am a Japanese person. <laughs> it's so funny. I mean, as, as good as people are saying the English voice acting is pretty good for Seven, but I don't know. Like, that game is so Japan-centric. Mm-hmm. I, I don't see myself playing yeah. with, with playing with the English dub. I mean, I saw a little bit of the English dub today because I was watching a video that ended up talking about it. It looks pretty good. Like, for, like, something that's, like, it's it's sort of like when you watch an anime dub, but, you know, like, you watch a Japanese anime, but, like, like the dub's in English. And when you hear a really good dub, you, it just kind of doesn't really matter to you. For me, that's how the Yakuza 7 one sounded. Like, it sounded really damn good. I, th- I, think, if a, I think if a dub is done well, I'll absolutely watch that mm-hmm. over the Japanese one. Like some, just some that kind of jump out of mine would probably be uh, Death Note, Full Metal Alchemist. Um, I I will yeah. not watch Dragon There's Ball the... Z in Japanese. I do not like Japanese yeah. Goku's voice. Dragon Ball Fighters is Dragon Ball Fighters freaks me out. Yeah, Dragon Ball Fighters has got me used to Grandma Goku, but I'm 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 still oh, Sean Shemmel all the way. Yeah, agreed. So it's like, and it's like, honestly, the fact that they even added an English job, because I know Judgment had had one, and apparently that one was really damn good, too. Mm-hmm. So it seems like they're finally getting down how to do a good one, and especially adding it in makes it much more accessible to so many other people. Well, so I'm glad a, that they're doing it. I know they had a bit of a marketing deal with Microsoft, so I, I would not be surprised if that was one of the uh, things that Microsoft might have even funded, just because... Um, Microsoft knows most of their player base is Western, and that's just an easier way for people to get into the series. Uh, let's see. Sarah, you, like I, are, are a gigantic Capcom fan. This is correct, yeah. yes? What do you think about the vegetable known as a leak? Uh, I have a whole thing of Hatsune Miku statues back there. You just can't see them. <laughs> <laughs> I do enjoy leaks, but also just a quick preface: I don't enjoy leaks that have actual people's info in them. That's not okay. Yep. And personally, I wouldn't call these leaks. I would call them legit stolen info. 
For the sake because of the pun, I will legit just toss a picture of a leak on stream. That's fine. But, yeah, but, yeah, yeah. This the, this one's the the Nintendo one. The Nintendo one from earlier this year was was fun and whimsical. This one's a little <laughs> less so. This yeah, one's so, significantly uh, less so. <laughs> so this with a little bit of background about a couple of weeks ago. Uh, I'm not going to name the hacker group because they go fuck themselves. A uh, hacker group came out and announced that they had stolen data from Capcom, Ubisoft, and Crytek. So like the crisis people. And they had said that they had stolen everything from in-game engines to game documents to Watchdogs. In, in a weird twist of fate, Watchdogs Legion source code. <laughs> which they then leaked Wait, part of it off. Yeah, Seriously? they, they yeah. grabbed Watchdogs wow. and source code. And they leaked part of it on online. They like leaked the the quest editor online. So these are not good leaks. They basically held these ransom and said if they don't get paid a certain amount of money by these companies, they would like drop everything. Well, the companies haven't paid them. Supposedly, the companies haven't paid them. So they started to drop stuff. And what they got from Capcom doesn't just include the games list that I am going to go over or just like name out now, but they got employee info they got addresses they got e e emails mm. they got passports from a few of them like this shit is not good guys mm. like this is not a good leak yeah like you social have those security funny... numbers yeah yeah like like they like you have those funny leaks where it's like oh you go to a source code to a website and they leak the release date for a game no that's not this this yeah is incredibly mm. malicious so before we go about going through this list of stuff and being excited about it, just know that this stuff was not gotten because of like someone leaked an email. No, this was gotten because personal info was leaked out, and this just happened to be a part of that info. One uh, of the more um, fucked up parts about this is that that uh, I won't I won't name the group either, but the hacker group is um, not holding it black. They're, they're holding it hostage. They want to get paid in order to release all all this back to Capcom, and uh, I think everyone here can. I think it's pretty safe to say we roundly condemn this, and those people can go yeah. fuck themselves. Uh, do you want me to go through the list really quick? Oh uh, yeah, go ahead, sir. Cool. So I'm just gonna go really quick, and then the supposed release windows of these titles. Uh, we got Resident Evil Outrage, which we don't know exactly what that is, but there's been speculation that there might be a new out outbreak title, which is quarter four, 2021. Dragon I hope Dolphin. it is better than Resident Evil Resistance, which was Please. packed in with three. Uh, Dragon's Dogma 2, which is quarter 2, 2022. Uh, there's Street Fighter 6. Uh, yay. Mesa, yay. Mm -hmm. uh, this is quarter 3 of 20 of... I would have thought that would have been more enthusiasm from you. <laughs> oh, it's just as expected. I, like, I, like, if, yeah, like, if you just pay attention to their releases, you can pretty much map out exactly what it was gonna come out anyway, so... Uh, <laughs> Rockman, which is Mega Man in English, uh, Match, which could be a Battle Royale game, we don't know, uh, Quarter 3, 2022, Resident Evil 4 re Remake, Quarter 4, 2022, which I'm just going to preface this by saying this has this, this hadn't been announced yet, but we all fucking figured it was coming. If they're doing 3, they might as well do 4. Resident uh, Evil 4 is my personal baby. That's my favorite game of all time. Please do this shit justice. Uh, Animusha Newark, don't know what that is, uh, Quarter 4, 2022, Monster Hunter 6, which is quarter 2 of 2023. Uh, Biohazard Apocalypse, which is quarter 3, 2023. Again, don't know what that is either. Biohazard uh, would be the Japanese name for yeah, Resident Evil. Yeah, don't know. It's Resident Evil. Uh, Super Street Fighter 6, quarter 4, 2023. You gotta wait for the Super wait, Street eight, Fighter. Gotta, gotta wait that extra year for the Super. Uh, Final Fight Remake, quarter 2 of 2024. Power Stone Remake. Oh, God. That's a name I haven't heard in ages. Yeah. Uh, quarter 3 I of 2024. Ultra Street Fighter 6. <laughs> <laughs> four of 2024. It's and then important. Resident Evil Hunk, which for those who don't know, that's most likely Hunk. Just someone accidentally put an A there. Uh, quarter 4 of 2024. Another thing that got released is that in April 2021 is the release date for Resident Evil Village, which is not surprising. A lot of people thought it was going to be early 2021, which makes total sense. Didn't and they? I don't want to say they announced it, but it's like they strongly hinted that it was coming next year, didn't they? No, no the ending of the Village reveal trailer said 2021. Oh, yeah. So, or like yeah, early 2021 or something. And the final thing is, is that Sony paid $5 million for Resident Evil 7 Bio, Biohazard's VR 
mode, which a lot of people say was the main selling point of that game yeah. and PSVR in general. Well, Google popped up <laughs> 10 million to get the game on Stadia, which it's like, oh boy, did anyone even play that on Stadia? Like I have, it, I, I, I really need to play the VR version of Seven. And it's so funny. I get that to Google, ten million dollars. They probably had that money lying around on a coffee table somewhere. But whenever I see Stadia even brought up at this point, it's just, it's like, oh yeah, that's still a thing because Google seems to have forgotten about it. Mm -hmm. I think in terms of giving options to players that might not necessarily have a console in the house, I know Mesa has, <laughs> has attested this uh, multiple times. Oh yeah. But, but for, I was, for those that have the internet available, like, yeah, sure, there's a great solution. And I was a big proponent of OnLive when that was a thing. Yeah. Oh, gee. But, Absolutely. Uh, I think more options is always good. But, yeah, every time I hear Stadia, I just can't help but grow and just be like, oh, that exists again? I mean, I Stadia is doing so poorly that their Google is giving me a Chromecast Ultra and a Stadia controller for free. So. <laughs> Please play it. <laughs> and then uh, hopefully the we'll the basically what we're getting from this list is that very obviously the success First of the Resident Evil re re remakes and with Resident Evil 7 and which Capcom's already betting on, on Village slash 8 being such a big thing for, for them we're not getting rid of Resident Evil anytime this soon, which is a big fan of that series. I'm super excited for it. It's how they handled two and three. I'm actually very excited about a remake of four. I think it can be really good if it's done by by the right people. And I think Capcom has shown that the right people can do really good re remakes of really old games. Uh, like Mesa mentioned, Street Fighter isn't so 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 surprising to me. I figure there is going to be a six at some point. So the many versions of it is making me feel like okay. I feel like that's almost well, like those are, for the course, right? That's well, those kind of common for them. Well, yeah, but those are what those are. It's, I know it looks like oh, just but those are those tend to be also system updates as well. There's new new features more than just new characters. Also, just like the game is going to play differently at those points. But that's also like a forty dollar, sixty dollar update. No, uh, not right? not not for not not since five. With five, okay. you just get the update. If okay. you have the original disc, you just get the update. Well, you can pay for the new characters if you want them, but you'll always get the update. What I thought was interesting was the... I mean, this leak made pretty big waves in the fighting game community, obviously, because on mm -hmm. one hand, you've got Street Fighter, uh, which is well known. What a lot of people don't realize is Power Stone mm -hmm. actually has a fighting game community, a competitive community. It's very small and very niche. I put it on par with something like Super Smash Brothers Melee, but it does exist. So this to them is like being thrown a bone after about twenty years. Absolutely, yeah. I think uh, before we move on to what we've been up to. I specifically want to touch on Resident Evil 4 just because I'm such a freaking uh, fanboy for it. Uh, I know they're not going to keep the tank controls for 4. That That's inevitable. It's going to play more akin to uh, 2 or th uh, two and 3 remakes, if anything. But that original game is so balanced with the tank controls in mind. Like, you have to radically change how enemies are able to approach you because everything is so tightly designed around those limitations, the way you aim, the way you can't move. Like, it's already so freaking perfect. And so, um, breaking away from that is going to be interesting to see how they, how mm -hmm. they, uh, well, you also of, how, how for... they compensate for that. Because, uh, what was it? The, I think it was the PS3, uh, 360 re releases of Resident Evil 1, the, uh, the re remake, or I guess remake, which was re remake. Yeah. Um, they, they added the option to have, well, you can still use the tank controls like on the D-pad, but if you're using the analog stick, you can just you know twirl around as much as you want, <laughs> and that broke the entire game because you're not supposed to run around and juke zombies. Like you're supposed to be locked in these stiff animations. So that game basically became a little bit of a joke in that regard. So I, I mean, hope that they rebalance it if they're going to go this way. I mean, with how two and three were especially three. Like I'm totally putting three in this over two. The way that they remade three, and yeah, you can argue that that they cut out a lot of important parts, like the whole clock clock towers segment and everything like that. But the way that they remade three and made it 
yes, it was as close to the original as they could make it, but it was also its own thing. I feel like just seeing how that handled it, and yes, a lot of people argue it wasn't handled well. I personally think it was handled amazingly, and I loved it. I think that's definitely going to show how they're going into 4, but I think they fully know that they're going to be remaking something that's so big with people that I think Mm -hmm. they... I I don't know. With how they handled 2 and 3, I have a feeling that Capcom knows what they're doing. And they're putting count- their best people on this. Like they yeah. know they're touching this with like, with like a yeah. ten, a, the two ten ten foot poles, as they know they're either going to make or break this by doing the smallest thing. So I have a feeling it's going to be handled good. I'm not yeah. exactly agreed. Yeah, I have so, a full confidence in that team, and uh, I, I guess I'm just more concerned just because that's my favorite game of all time. <laughs> oh no! And I- um, like like with two and three in particular, you know, with those being um, PS1 games, they're in much more dire need. I would still argue, aside from people that aren't able to adapt to tank controls, that Resident Evil Four, like you could probably just remaster like whole new textures, and it, it would be good as new. But well, yeah. Eagerly anticipating either way. I mean, spoilers for the end of like the Resident Evil 3 remake, I guess. But you can tell that they're kind of not exactly changing the canon, but they're slowly starting to add a little bit more story changes. And I know what you're talking changes. about. So mm. it's like, I feel like 4 isn't going to be a shot for shot remake, especially with how 3 and 2 happened. Honestly, I have that's how I that, prefer it. Yeah, I feel yeah. like that 4 is going to be its own like thing but it's going to fit in this new canon like i don't think they're going to change a lot i think they're going to do what what what, what they did with three and add those very small changes to make it a part of this like new canon keep the laser hallway let my boy uh do some matrix stuff 100 percent going to keep the laser hallway if they don't i feel like people are going to be pissed (laughs) in general though i think whatever you can say about capcom they do have a certain degree of respect and reverence for their franchises that some other publishers now might lack. But yeah, I mean, yeah. <laughs> Back in 2012, do. not so much. <laughs> but at least with Resident Evil. Yeah. years. Yeah. So, Absolutely. Nitra, what, what have you been up to? What have you been playing? I know we're uh, running a little up? bit later than usual, but I'm more than happy to have the podcast go on a little bit longer. Uh, you want the full list? Because I could go on for a while. We'll be here until 3 in the morning my time. <laughs> but... <laughs> uh, well, I think one of, uh, one of the things I set out to do in 2020 was kind of scale back from multiplayer because I said to myself, look, I have all these amazing single player games that I've really wanted to play for a long time. And topically, what I really wanted to play was Outer Worlds, which I did not get when it came out because at the time I was going through a massive work crunch and it just seemed like a really bad idea to get invested in, in a big Obsidian RPG. And I love it. It's basically New Vegas, but more polished, more balanced, fewer characters who are all wonderful. And I, I mentioned this earlier. It's basically, it's, it's like if Amazon had just a bit of a sense of humor. That's what, that's what I love about it. It's so topical and so relevant. And I think Obsidian has just done such a brilliant job with it. I think one of my favorite parts about... Um about outer worlds is that uh it's it's on a smaller scale it's not a giant open world they're kind of like i think correct me if i'm wrong i think there's like maybe four or five like tiny open worlds like like more of hubs than anything so it's like really nice and tight and concise Mm -hmm. like it's dense There's, there's something around every corner versus just like a bit of a empty landscape yeah exactly i draw a comparison to the yakuza series where It's a very small world, but it feels very big because it's very deep. And there's a lot going on in all of the section, in all of the areas where you can go and where you can traverse. And it also helps that the other thing that I really like about it is that all of your, you have six, I'm not sure, have all of you played Outer Worlds? Uh, I'm very thankful that Xbox made it a Game Pass exclusive. Same, because they bought the... Because I am not a Fallout person. I just I don't like Fallout. I've never been into it. The whole dead eyed stare always freaks the fuck out of out of me. Where it's like, yeah. hello traveler, please help save my child. And I'm like, no thanks. Oh, that yeah. is too accurate. Probably ate them. <laughs> like it literally like it makes you wish for a nuclear winter. Yeah, I like hate it you for that. Out of, out of me. So it's like I was glad that they made it on Game Pass because I was able to download it. And I think I played it for like six or seven hours. 
and I had fun with it, but I feel like I only had fun with it because it's free. <laughs> The other thing I like about it is that you have you have six other um, characters you can recruit, mm -hmm. and what I like about them is that there are fewer characters, so there's more development given to each of them. But they're all just really pleasant people, and I've mentioned this a couple of times. Absolutely, the, I feel like I a big problem in the games writing is that uh, there's the, the people tend to confuse being a complicated character with just being a jackass. <laughs> and just I mean, to be, to be yeah, fair, I, I I would not use the word pleasant to describe. Uh, what's the guy's name? Vicar. Uh, okay, yeah, uh, the vicar. Yeah, I forget his <laughs> yeah, name. He's, he's he's pretty. I would I would say the one that that, that that's like, it's a bit of a stretch is um <laughs> Ellie. Yeah, I mean, even the people who are not as pleasant as Parvati, yeah. who I love her, she's yeah. just in my party all the time. I mean, I will say that that game gave us an actual. Uh, I love Neil. Sexual character, which as which as a fellow ace, definitely felt really good to have that representation. Yeah, definitely. So, I appreciated that. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, even the people who are a little jerky in your party, they have like Freudian excuses for why they act that way, and they don't just they don't just choose scenery and just act like rah, rah, look at how deep and complex I am when I'm just being a jerk to everyone I meet. They're not like that. They're a little abrasive, but they act like human beings. Mm -hmm. And by the way, and that is one thing I've noticed is that the, the, the creepy fallout stare, that's much, much better than it was, especially oblivion. I can't play oblivion because especially <laughs> when they zoom in on everybody's faces, it's like they're trying to eat my soul. I can't play that game. I remember seeing videos back in the day. Um, one of my friends would send me, uh, what's the name of the anoint, the the adoring fan? We just like sprint up to you and just like dead staring you in the face. I'm like, oh, that's funny that that one character does that. And then no, he claims like, everybody. no, that's that's everyone. Yeah, that makes I, me kind of why and kind of kind of off topic. Kind of worried about that. Uh, what the hell was that? Star game that Todd Howard game. I, I know it. Yeah, kind of worried yeah. me about. Starfield because it's like oh god now now I don't need like alien races giving me dead eyed stares as they're like please save my space colony and I'm like no <laughs> I think <laughs> um, I think one of my favorite yeah, things Starfield. about the Outer Worlds is actually how much you can avoid combat mm -hmm. by uh, by yeah. specking in the in the uh, dialogue oh, yeah. not trees the uh, dialogue skills and a lot of them are I mean the entire game is just written so damn well so just being able to talk your way out of these situations is just great and I, I think it would be a welcome change to most games if they were to implement these so I'm sorry was that sir uh, I remember for the amount of combat that I did I avoided all combat save for like one thing <laughs> save for like one encounter that I like fucked up on I was just like oh and I'm getting experience for not even killing people it's, like, it's crazy yeah and it's not like the game doesn't steer you towards combat. It's really there are multiple ways to get experience points. And if you want to complete go completely Rambo, that's great. But there are so many ways to play the game. And, and I know that's that's a very common marketing tagline. But in this case, it really is true. Oh, I think we just lost. Whoops. Oh, whoop. Uh -oh. stream you are now, Sarah. I am I am me and Nitro. I'm so sorry. I don't know what the fuck just happened. That's OK. Oh, no. OK. I, I'm so sorry. <laughs> I am staring at myself twice, and it is wow. kind of freaky. I'm sorry. <laughs> oh my god, I'm so sorry. You know what? Just like, put a picture of Blitz on the screen. That'll be who I am for this, in, this entire All podcast. Right. Okay. I'm, I'm going to go ahead and fix this. Uh, Nitro, you want to go so ahead and sorry. just continue uh, on what you've been playing? Yeah, so uh, what else have I been playing here is Hades, actually. And... You know, I, I literally just started playing this maybe a couple of days before, just to give you an idea of where I stand with it. I've started playing it a couple of days before, uh, you know, we sat down here. I've already got 10 hours in the game. So it definitely gets my seal of approval. Combat is amazing. With It's pretty much exactly what I would expect from Supergiant, which is to say very enjoyable combat or gameplay just in general. Um, absolutely gorgeous art style. A uh, very punchy dialogue. That's always been something that that's appealed to me about Supergiant, and like a lot of, it's got a very pick up and play quality to it. That's that's what I like about Supergiant's games in general as well, where you can pretty much just drop in and immediately know what you're doing. But I'm not sure. I would say Hades is my game of the year, but it's definitely in the top five. I 
I admittedly haven't really clicked with any of their previous works. I think I played Transistor a bit because it was a PS Plus game. But just given kind of the critical goal, the uh, critical acclaim that um, Hades has been has been met with, I think I'll, I have so many other games on my backlog, but I'll get around to it eventually. I plus, have it, plus it helps and all the characters are hot. So oh god, yeah, I've I, yeah. I've always appreciated super giant games more for their storytelling yeah. than their gameplay. To be honest, I played every super giant game. I've beaten every super giant game. <laughs> I just haven't done a full run on Hades yet, and honestly, I'm just not a big uh, roguelike person, so it's really hard yeah, for yeah. me. But it's like I I love their storytelling. I love how they do characters. I love their voice acting. Like it's just everything else, but the gameplay. I'm such a huge fucking fan of. Yeah, and like, if it's it, oh, go ahead. Sorry. No, no. It's just like everything they do in their in their games makes them unique and makes them different. And to me, that's such like a gaming thing for me like just having them every release that they've done has been something different and well, it's that's been the, interesting and it's been fun <laughs> so that's the thing about hades and if it sets your mind at ease it will they actually i was a little tentative as well i'm not a huge roguelite fan myself but they would so i was a little apprehensive going in but not only is it it's got that super giant charm but they kind of weave the storytelling into the fact that it's a roguelite so you may be pleasantly surprised at how they handle it. I don't want to give oh, too no. much away. So I've actually played it. I played it oh, right oh, when it came out on early access. Like I was okay. really early. Yeah, I bought it on day one when they announced it at the Game Awards. So I actually oh, played okay. it way so, before they had like anything. You passed. played it before me. Oh yeah, I played it before anything they had passed the Hydra. So like oh, I actually, okay. yeah, I played it like literally as soon as it released on early early access. So, uh, I hate to be that. I played it for everybody else person, but, like, I I was in it super early. I loved it super, super early. I just haven't gotten a chance to, like, get around and sit down and play through the full game. Okay. Yet. All right, so. nice. Let's see. You Have you been playing, uh, I guess I kind of know. You've been playing Smash lately also, right? You, uh, yes, you... I've been playing a lot of that. <laughs> <laughs> you want to tell us a little bit about that? Well... I think, you know, the great thing about Smash Ultimate is that I know this may be a bit of a, contro a controversial take. I think it's the best entry in the series, hands down. And I know that might upset is, a lot of... Oh, go ahead. Is, is that a controversial take? I, I know there's always going to be, like, diehard uh, Melee mm -hmm. fans. But um, I, I guess what what's kind of the perspective from the community on Ultimate, I guess? I guess the perspective is that some, like, really hardcore players don't like some of the features they've introduced, like the ability to short hop auto attack. Uh, they don't like the fact that it's faster, but not necessarily as flashy as melee. It's a lot of very technical complaints, which I personally don't understand because I think I love the fact that it's faster than Smash 4 and especially Brawl. I love the fact that it's very accessible now. I, and the fact that you can now do a lot of the more complicated moves more easily, like short hop into neutral air, to air attacking or just doing short hop attacks in general. I think it broadens the tournament scene and makes it makes it much more accessible to more people. And I think that's something we've seen where in conjunction with the fact that the Switch is a much more successful system than the Wii U, the competitive Smash scene seems to have expanded very significantly. I mean, even Evo 2019 had, I think, 3,500 uh, people registered, which yeah, not a huge number on its own, but for Smash... Considering 10 years ago, the general consensus was, uh, with Smash was, oh, this is a party game. Why would you play this competitively? It, it's a big deal. Right. And I just think mm -hmm. the way this series has evolved is just amazing. So when you mainly play it nowadays, are you just kind of matching up against randoms? Are you doing uh, matches? Or what's your approach? So... I'm mostly playing it when I play. I, I play it on stream a lot uh, when I when I stream on Twitch. And what I usually do is, well, it sucks because we can't go to uh, in person weeklies right now because of COVID. But what I've done is basically you set you can set up an open arena and have people challenge you. And what I often do, and what most people who stream Smash do, is just have like a line of people who, to either challenge you directly. Or with some of the people who play me who, who are a little newer to the game, I'll kind of watch them fight each other, and then I'll essentially be on commentary where I critique them, say, oh, you should edge guard more, you should shield more, just things like that. And I don't know if I've mentioned this 
I uh, I have been a Pikachu main in Smash since 64. Uh, I've been very, very happy with how that's turned out because Pikachu was already... Pikachu's been pretty consistently top t- high to top tier ranked throughout the series. And he was... Or it was massively buffed in the transition from Smash 4 to Ultimate to the point where it's arguably the best character in the entire game. So I've been very happy about that. With hmm. my uh, very limited knowledge of hmm. the competitive scene for um, for Smash, that actually kind of surprised me to hear that Pikachu's up there. It's uh, it's not it's not just cl- it's just not clouded with uh, foxes up up there actually, anymore. Here, let me look at the tier list. So. In Smash 64, Pikachu is number one on the tier list, so he was considered the best in the game. Oh, wow. Uh, in Melee, he's considered ninth out of 26 on the tier list, which is like which is C tier, so yeah. he still gets a good... He still it's gets decent. the tier, yeah. Yeah. In Brawl, he was ranked 8th eight, out of 38th on the tier list. Uh, he still saw a decent amount of playtime. So Smash 4, he was considered 15th out of 55th. Poor Jigglypuff uh, on the tier list. <laughs> and uh, Ultimate doesn't have an officially doesn't have an official tier list yet, uh, due from the Smash Backroom, mostly because of a changing metagame for all the DLC characters. But uh, to your point, Fox has also done pretty well throughout the series, although he was he was nerfed somewhat in the transition from four to ultimate, but He's actually he's he's maintained pretty solid results. Uh, Light, who is in my state, he's the, he's tenth in the world right now. Mains Fox and does very well with him. Where does my boy Steven uh, fall on the tier list? No. General consensus is that he's mid to high tier. I think. Oh uh, wow. I mean, he's definitely not upper high tier or let alone top tier. Uh, he's got a little lot of good combo game, but his move set is incredibly janky, and. He's got a bit of RNG associated with mm. his damage output. That's always been a problem with certain characters. Yeah. So I think people appreciate him for the novelty. I'm not sure if he's going to make much of an impact when it comes to tournaments. Okay. Yeah. That is a lot of knowledge uh, for someone who uh, who plays with items. Yeah, I. <laughs> it's it's funny because the I, I I always like to keep in mind, and I tell other people who play the game competitively. When I say I'm ninety nine better than ninety nine percent of people who play Smash, that's not the smug snarking that it sounds like. I'm saying that in the context of the oh, overwhelming man. people who play Smash play it as a casual party game, and and I also say that I consider myself above average competitively at best. But yeah, so I'm, the competitive scene is tiny, but it, it's growing. So. And especially without Nintendo's assistance, so so I think that's pretty laudable. I think my general issue with with most games, and especially Smash, was I'm easily the best person in my friend group, and so it's no fun playing against any of my friends. But I'm not good enough mm-hmm. to go to tournaments and win, even though I won one at my uh, at my high school um, back in like 2011 or something. But yeah, I'm not that good. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, it's so funny because. I'm now at a point where, I mean, I basically, I spend, I'm as good as I am, relatively speaking, because I basically spend every non-COVID Sunday getting this shit kicked out of me by the top players in New England. So I can go to really casual tournaments and I'll pretty much sweep the entire winner's bracket. And like I said, I, 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 I try to say, I try to keep it in mind that I'm not necessarily good. I'm just sort of a big fish in a small pond at that point. Right. And it's funny because now I almost can't play the game casually. Like when I sit down and play with my <laughs> friends with items on, I immediately go into like these immaculate Pikachu combos that I spent days and days mastering and everyone else would just be like, Nitro, calm down. It's <laughs> like it, I have to turn it, it off. Has it yeah. ruined it? Uh, has it ruined like casual play for you whatsoever or? Not Maybe really. I, I, I just have to make sure sh- i had to, i just have to keep it in check sometimes mm-hmm. that look w- all stages are legal items are on just relax and have a little fun do you have a casual character i probably still use pikachu even mm-hmm. as my casual character just like because for me, <laughs> my problem was always and every time i try to start doing a casual character i ended up like oh really that works oh let me try <laughs> let me practice the-. and then they stop being a casual character yeah <laughs> that's the immediately problem. 
<laughs> I don't think I ever even really had a main. Like, I would have, like, certain characters I'm pretty good with. But, like, if I'm playing with friends, I just stick myself on random and just deal with whoever I get. That, yeah, that's probably a very bad way to get good. I mean, oh, on one hand it is, but on the other hand, you get a, you get a ton of different experience with yeah, different characters. Yeah, you learn how to play the video game, which is very yeah. good. Exactly. Yes. A lot of people learn how to play the character and then learn how to play the video game. You can, If you learn how to play the video game first, you can go much further far, faster. I need, and what's the Mr. Miyagi steps? You have to wax the car. <laughs> mop, yeah. Mop the floor. <laughs> uh, let's see. What else you been up to? Who, me? Yes, you. Ooh. Pikachu. Oh, okay. <laughs> so, you know, I played this earlier in the year. I don't know if anyone else has played Black Mesa. I have. Okay, so... I pretty much went into Black Mesa totally blind. I played Half-Life 2, I've played the episodes, I've played Alex. I had never played the original Half-Life before, so bear that in mind. I started with 2. You saved yourself and a lot of trouble, my friend. So I've been told, because, you know, when I, I mean, I was very impressed with what they did with Black Mesa, but it wasn't until I installed the original game on Steam, just as a point of comparison, that I realized, holy crap. And then, I kind of played them side by side, and it wasn't, it wasn't until I got to Zen, that was when I realized, now I know what they spent the majority of their time on, because they basically turned what I understand is the most hated section of the entire game into one that I, I know, I still knew Zen got still kind of a, and by comparison reception from what I understand, I thought it was great, but, but what they did with it is just nothing short of jaw dropping. I think uh, New Zen is definitely a gigantic step up from uh, from original Zen, but that being said, it's not it's still not my favorite part of the game. Yeah, it's definitely. I have issues with it. It's a little disorienting. I had to confront a couple of walkthroughs just to get a sense of where I was supposed to be going, and it lacks some. the every, The entire game up until Zen feels very tight, and it feels very um, well defined yeah. in terms of where you need to go and. It's a little disorienting when you get to Zen, but it's leagues better than the original. I, I fully stand behind that. I think every little detail they put, because like, there's even some levels that they kind of omit in Black Mesa instead of just like redesigning around them. There, there's actually one specific point that pit, that will always consistently piss me off in the original release was, um, do you recall the little sniper hideout and there's like a bunch of mines everywhere? Oh god, yes, I remember in, that. In, in the original game, you can't see the mines, you can't see the snipers, and so you're, you're trying to like just rapidly jump across this minefield without knowing like what's going to happen. Uh, so that game, at that point, the, ba the game basically devolves into I need an F5 to quick save every every two seconds. Yes, yeah. and uh, just being able to see the mines in the remake. Thank you. Yeah, that just a lot. The remake, it's. I mean, I know it's kind of controversial to list remakes as Game of the Year potential. We see that with FF7 Remake. But for me personally, it, it, it's got potential for Game of the Year for me personally. I mean, it came out this year anyway, officially. I think they were working on the last part of Zen for, I want to say, like a year and a half. Yeah, it, it shows. It's What they've done with it is amazing. I, I think at this point, I think even one of the developer the one of the original developers for the original Half Life came out and said like, "Yeah, you don't have to play original Half Life anymore. Just play this." I remember so, this. Yeah. Uh, here, let me see if I can find the exact quote. God, I really need to go yeah. back and play it. Here, so Dario Casali, I think that I'm pronouncing that correctly, a designer at Valve who has worked on all Half Life games. Remarked in an interview that during development on Half-Life Alex, he attempted to play the entirety of the original Half-Life again for research, but after five hours decided to play Black Mesa instead, reasoning it was a much more enjoyable product. Hmm. That's great. That's beautiful. <laughs> Interesting. Let's see. What time is it? It's nine. We, we can go mm -hmm. on for a bit longer. Sarah, do you, do you have a cutoff time for tonight? Uh... Probably before 10, because I am kind of sleepy. <laughs> uh, okay. It's, it's also, midnight here. I also want to make, make, make a I also want to make a run. And you know, that means we got an hour left. Okay. Let's see. Uh, do you want to go through the rest of your stuff real quick then, Nitro? 
That way Sarah can want... talk about the snacks of the bug variety. Yay. Yeah, so what else was on here that I completed? Oh, yeah. I finally played Yakuza Kiwami this year. And, yeah, I mean, I know we've talked about this series so much. And it's just, it was like, the last Yakuza I played was four. And that was a while ago. I played three, absolutely adored it. Played four, absolutely adored it. I'm not sure why I missed five or six. I couldn't even tell you, but they're definitely on the list. But I figured a good place to start was Kiwami. And it was like coming home. I mean, I know that, you know, Kamurocho is like the same as it's always been. And I just, I, you know, meeting Kiryu again, meeting Majima again, especially. Majima, I will never get tired of him. I think uh, um, I know the the series goes in like a couple different cities for some others. I know like five has five completely different cities you go in. Yeah. Honestly, I think my favorite. I just like Kamurocho. I, I have no issue with the game just mm -hmm. recycling the same place. Maybe oh, that's yeah. why I like four so much compared to five. Well, I think part of it for me also, and maybe it's because I haven't played the series, hadn't played the series since four. It's not like you know the game. Yeah, yeah. Yakuza doesn't release often enough to really need any kind of innovation. It doesn't really get stale. It doesn't feel boring or tiring in any way. And it's also helped by the fact that it, the stories in the games get a little crazy sometimes, but for the most part, especially in Kiwami, I always had a pretty good idea of where I was going, what I was doing. And can we talk about Majima everywhere for a minute? Because yes. that was such a great inclusion. I, actually, you know what? I just remembered one thing I completely forgot to mention earlier when you said... Um... The uh, development studio behind it just has like such a lockdown on production schedules. And I think so much of that is that they're able to prioritize like what's important in the game. Like, yes, let's make our main characters look good. Let's refine the combat system. And like, yeah, admittedly, there's like some PS2 looking potato faces on random NPCs. But if if that's what we have to deal with in order to get people working like normal hours, I'm fine with that. Yeah, agreed. One thing I just, I will never get tired of, and I mentioned this in SDGC as well, is that I love the fact that none of Majima's soldiers are ever bothered by anything <laughs> he does anymore. It's like, hey, the boss is dressing up as a club hostess and he's making us act like zombies. Is it Tuesday? <laughs> like, to them, it's just another day at the office at this point. Isn't there a scene in, um, in Yakuza 4... I think like even the all the citizens of Kamurocho are just like yeah Majima just exists just roll with it where he floods the entire city with like his freaking um, the Majima family members they just flood the entire streets like yeah. there's no traffic and no one even brings it up just like well that was weird yeah and like, even that that's that appears during Saijima I think this is how you pronounce his name Saijima story arc and even he just looks at it like mm, cool like he's not surprised <laughs> at all. But then I think everyone at this point at in Kamurocho is just so used to everything. Like if you, I don't know if maybe it was just me. I could have sworn that there. I'm pretty sure you can see cops in the background when Kiryu is beating the shit out of random people on the street. I think you can. They just they just don't care. Yeah, they're just <laughs> like, hey, we're on duty in Kamurocho. Who cares? Then again, this is the same series where it has the like central plot point of Kiryu's, Kiryu doesn't kill people. He's like Batman. Meanwhile, you can take a samurai sword and shove it through someone's gut and shoot him in the face with a gun. But he doesn't kill people. I still remember Injustice 2, where we were talking about fighting games. That's one of the few non-Smash fighting games I've clicked with. And there's this point where Damian Wayne um, says to Batman after he beats the living crap out of two henchmen... He says, so you won't kill people, but you're fine with traumatic brain injuries. <laughs> and Batman just walked away. And I'm like, um, Batman, that, that's a legitimate point. Batman's not killing people. He's just shooting a giant rubber shell from his tank Batmobile into someone's face. He's not killing yeah. them. They're he's fine. not running them over. He's zapping them. He's, he's pushing them out of the way. Yeah, I just wanted to call, like, Batman, can we get an answer for that, please? That's a good question. <laughs> Oh, jeez. But, uh, yeah, I'm glad you, you've had a good time with uh, Kiwami. Yeah, have it you, was have, it's amazing. Have you played them in order? Or where did you... So you started with the original one. Well, oh, no, was, I actually... Go ahead. I'm, oh, no, I'm sorry, you good. I was just going to say that. So, believe it or not, my first one was three. I reviewed that. I loved it at the time. And then I played four, I which I also reviewed. 
And then I kind of fell out with the series without even meaning to. It wasn't really conscious. But then I also just, I, you know, again, like I said, this year I've been revisiting games that I had been meaning to play for a while. Kiwami was one of them. And now I've installed... The one regret that I have... Um, after I, When I played Kiwami, I also played the original uh, PS2 Yakuza just for the comparison, which was interesting, to say the least. And then the only slight regret I have, now that I'm playing Yakuza 0, is Nishiki's comments about how he'd never betray Kiryu are depressing <laughs> now. <laughs> like, if, if you play 0 with that knowledge, you're just like, ah, oh, this is a ticking time bomb. This is a yeah. <laughs> and I know... The fan base is kind of divided. Some people say that you should start with Kiwami to get the, like, you know, the official experience of playing the games in order, so to speak. Others just say play from, you know, zero to one to, to two to what, whatever. It's it's like the Star Wars movies debate. Yeah, it's weird that the new Star Wars trilogy only had, like, two movies. They never made a third one. That's, that's weird. <laughs> oh, boy. No. That, that's a whole other thing. Mason knows my thoughts on it very, very well. I, I would say it was worth it for the audience. Lot. It was worth it for the audience. For my audience, at least. <laughs> I got to live with my audience. It was beautiful. Uh, so what else have you been up to, Nitro? You're a man of many games. Yes, I... If you want, I could go through the full list of games that I've played this year. Uh, you're going to get some... Or the full list of games that I've completed this year. Yeah, you're going to see some surprising ones on here. Uh, we we can go through a couple real quick. I know Sarah is is vehemently wanting to discuss her bug snacks. Yeah. So, I, okay. So since we're here, you know what? I, what, I, I don't want to take any more time away from Sarah so she can talk about bug snacks. But let's quickly discuss. I finally played finished Titanfall two this year, and you, holy crap, what was I waiting for? <laughs> so good. It's fantastic. Yeah. Mm-hmm. One of the best it, shooters ever. Uh, it's just so amazing because I feel like one of the most influential, possibly the most well-crafted, potent- what could have been one of the most influential shooters of all time came out, and everyone was just like, eh. And that's, I mean, that's not the game's fault. Um, I, I, Seth, I know we've talked about this. The, w- the way the game was handled in terms of release was just shameful. There wasn't that much marketing, and then uh, Mm -hmm. EA, the publisher behind it, they sandwiched the release dates. What was it? It was Battlefield, Titanfall, and then uh, Call of Duty, which, you know, between those two behemoths, like, no one bought it. Yeah, and then on top of it, I'm pretty sure that was the same month as Last Guardian and Final Fantasy XV, which I just don't know what... Okay, look, and I get that those are very different genres, but for people who... Are more who are kind of gaming connoisseurs who will play anything. That's just taking. That's just giving. That's just taking away from your potential audience share so much. Releasing a game during that kind of blitz, especially when all those properties are very well established versus Titanfall, which was the little fish in that pond. Yeah, it's weird because Titanfall originally, that was one of those games in the early 2010s that. The, the hype juggernaut for Titan, the original Titanfall was absolutely ridiculous. I remember it. And then it came out, and I feel like nobody ever heard of nobody ever played it again. It's I mean, uh, the original release was Titanfall only uh, multiplayer, so I didn't play it. Actually, no. I got it for PC, like, I want to say 2014. It came out 2013. But yeah, it was, it was decent enough, but it wasn't until Titanfall 2 where they... Where you really get to use that platforming, like in the context of a campaign, with specifically yeah. designed levels for that, which is like this is amazing. Mm. Yeah, and it was an amazing mm. campaign. Like, I, I mean, I know people said the characters were flat, but the characters I felt like it's the it's the Mario Odyssey syndrome, where the characters are just sort of a vehicle to explore the gameplay, and there was so much of that, and it was so beautifully orchestrated and crafted that I just I went along with the story. I mean, I was fine with it, but the gameplay, I didn't want it to end. BT is a beautiful robot. Mm-hmm. I agree. All those thumbs up. Yeah. And um, maybe a slightly controversial opinion on it. I I don't want to say I don't enjoy the Titan combat. I just think the pilot, um, what, the, what they call just you as a foot soldier, I think that combat is just significantly better. Yeah, I mean the the Titan combat it's fine, but when you're 
dashing about, parkouring, wall jumping. You you feel like Spider Man by comparison. God, I I'm gonna have to reinstall Titanfall two now. <laughs> yeah, it has that effect. <laughs> I mean, uh, it is on game Game Pass because EA has all their EA Play stuff on a true. Game Pass. Is is this exactly. sponsored by Game Pass or something? Oh, well, might as well be. Know, should be. Just, uh, Great Shadow Legends hit me up. What they did was they made a deal with EA Play, so now pretty much every EA title that's ever been on Xbox console is on Game Pass now. Yeah, I'm just gonna make a oh. tweet at Raid Shadow Legends at this point. <laughs> Let's see. Any other smaller, quick ones you want to go through real quick before we talk about snacking on bugs? Um, who else is... I mean, a bunch of these are... I mean, I mean, I could talk about Assassin's Creed. I could talk about... Oh, you know what I'm working on right now is Super Mario U Deluxe. I actually never finished that, and I'm finally getting to a point where I'm kind of close to completing it. That's one of those games where it never really got the love it deserved because it was on the Wii mm-hmm. U. So yeah. I'm glad to see it getting a second chance. Mm. But uh, I've, yeah, I never played, unfortunately. But from what I heard, everyone I've heard talk about it said it's the best 2D Mario game. Yeah, people kind of sleep on it because probably because it was on the Wii U. Yeah. Also, but... probably also because it was another new Super Mario Brothers. It was the fourth one that came out at that point in time. So I yeah, think that probably didn't enough, help it. I think it's good enough level design, but. I, it was just fatigue at that point. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But there's nothing fundamentally wrong with it. It's a damn solid one of those games. It's basically, it's got that same, Nintendo has, it's got that quality where it's kind of like the Yakuza series where it's got the Nintendo commitment to quality where it's going to be mechanically amazing. Just even if you don't personally like that type of game. Yeah. It's just amazing how, like, obviously they already have that foundation there for how to design a Mario level, but Nintendo just has such a fundamental understanding of game design, how to introduce mechanics, how to introduce level progression. It's it's just fucking perfect. It is. And mm. and what they do and I love their commitment to keeping things fresh and interesting that that has bit them in the ass a few times at <laughs> Star Fox Zero, but for the most part I think it works out really well. Yeah, that wasn't really a platinum certified game by any stretch of the imagination. I will not apologize hey. for that pun. Hey, if they were more, hey, if they were more involved, that game would have been better. That's all I'm gonna say. Yeah. <laughs> Let's see. I, th- I think we've teased it enough. Sarah, are you eager? Yeah. yeah. Bugs I'm eager next. now. Bugs yeah, next. I, Bugs I still haven't even played the game. We, so we will bring you on. Snack. We'll bring you on many a time, Nitro. You're more so, than welcome. Uh, so, just a quick like thing before I start talking about this. It's going to be very hard to talk about this game because I don't want... Both me... May still totally jump into because he's totally beaten it too. Mm-hmm. We don't want to discuss anything mm-hmm. about the ending whatsoever mm-hmm. because it's just... Bug Snacks is like Spec Ops the line before I, everyone knew what the twist in Spec Ops was. You don't talk of, you didn't talk about the twist in Spec Ops because you wanted people to figure it out on their own. Which honestly, if you read Heart of Heart of Darkness back in high school, like every like everybody else did, you probably figured it out. Wait, like, is that a thing? It, is that required reading in in high school? Uh, I never. So, not for me. Is, I'm from Illinois. I was in accelerated reading courses up until my senior year of high school, and I oh, it was look at you. It was uh, it was required reading for us. Damn, dude! I just read of my <laughs> oh, an animal <laughs> farm. <laughs> yeah, big facts. At one point, <laughs> and write a paper on it. Um, <laughs> big facts. Big facts like bug snacks. <laughs> <laughs> I, was, I was busy but, tending the rabbits. But no, like mm. to be completely honest, it's gonna be very hard to talk about bug snacks because you don't want to spoil anything about bug snacks. But oh my god, bug snacks is a fucking blast! It is. So the one thing I will say about this game that I really enjoy is that you can't, as in gameplay me- mechanic wise, you can't die. Yep. In Bug Snacks, there's no like end game. There's no game over. You just either get frozen by a snack or you get set on fire by a snack or you accidentally fall off a cliff and you get teleported back in. The like, animation no... for getting set on fire is pretty funny too. Yeah. Like like there's no real you, you you like see your little like arms mm-hmm. flailing and you're just like eh. your grump pause. Like, your little, your little, like, your little grump, 
Instagram pause, but there's like there's no real way to die. So the whole the whole base about Bug Snacks is it's a puzzle game. You're basically helping these creatures called the Grumpuses get bug snacks, and every bug snack has a different way that it's caught. So some are either really easy, you just throw a trap down, catch it, pick up the trap, and you're done. But there's some that require you to like throw sauces at them. So there's uh, chocolate, hot sauce, mayonnaise, ketchup, and peanut butter. And oh, cheese. and cheese. Cheese as well. I forgot about cheese. And, <laughs> <laughs> and every there's different biomes on Snack Tooth Island, which is the uh, Bug Snack Island. And there's different snacks in different biomes. So you can have like a snack that's made out of a, a s'mores. There is different types of soda in different types of biomes. It's just the most adorable thing that I have ever played. It is very cute. Every snack has its own little snack phrase that it says, and there's little voice actors for them. So, like, yeah. every snack sounds different, which is ad ad adorable. And the humor in this game is just so, like, it's more dry humor than anything else. And so it's a lot of fun because you expect it to be, like, super, like, slapstick humor. And there is a little bit of slapstick in there, but I found a lot of it's dry. And I that's what made it funnier to me, is it's just like, oh, this is extremely like this, like this character came to Snack Tooth Island because of a depressing reason, but it's kind of funny. Like it's, it's, you, you never expect bug snacks, and then bug snacks happens, and you're like, oh my god, there's a game about catching snacks that are bugs, and you feed them to these walrus people, and they're so excited about having like one of those twisty Taco Bell cinnamon sticks as no. <laughs> I think um, the most interesting thing for me, like I always kind of. I uh, knew the gameplay was going to be like this weird uh, Pokemon Snap kind of like capturing these guys, uh, bug snacks. But the most interesting part is that there's actually, like as you said, we won't go like in depth with with the details, but it has much more of a story than I was actually anticipating. Oh, oh yeah. yeah, every character has their own reason why they went to the island. Mm -hmm. And they also have very, um, you know, everyone's relationship with everybody. Uh -huh. By the end of the game, there's and you don't need a relationship tree just because there's there's only there's what twelve thirteen people. It's pretty easy to remember who's ah uh, this person hates this person ah uh, this person likes this person. It, 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 it's very good. It's very good. And like some do you of develop the social relations? links? Huh? Do you develop social links with them? Kind of. Kind of. Like every 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 Grumpus has their own like side quest that you can do. Which my mm -hmm. one. If I had, it's not really like a, it, what's the word for it? It's not that it's a complaint, but it's a little like, like a little like mm -hmm. nitpick thing that I had. Mm -hmm. I wish they had said that the side quests were more important. Yeah. Because I the side quests just seem like side quests. Like, like, like they have their own tab in your journal that say side, mm -hmm. side quests. But after beating the game, I won't go any further than that, and like googling stuff just just to be curious, the side quests were more important than I thought they were going to be. So I'd wish that the game had sort of like had said they were also, more. They also, they do a really poor job of also telling you when it's resolved. You know, like um, there's no like locations or anything like that. Oh, really? And there's no, like, you know, like, you know how, like, the persona, like, oh, we did it, music plays at the end of, uh, <laughs> of an S, like, that doesn't really happen. It, I feel like, I feel like it, 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 it's missing something like that. Yeah, and it seems like it'll give you a side quest that seems like the last quest in, like, a line, and then you mm -hmm. do it, and you're done, and then more stuff comes up, like, after you bring more Grumpuses back to the camp. Yeah. Like, how much do you want me to do for you, walrus person? Like, it's... Mm -hmm. Because it's like the side quests start to add up as more grumpuses come back to the island or, or come back to your camp. So it's like you, they start to pile on top and you're like, I just have so much shit I got to do. And then once again, once I find, found out they were more important, it was more like th there was just so many of them. And it's like, it's cool. I think it's great they have side, side quests and it gets you to catch more bug snacks because every person requires a different snack. So it's extremely interesting, but it's just I wish there was more like thing mm -hmm. telling me that they were more Im important. I know um, both Sarah and Mesa have been bugging me to go ahead and play it because, especially because it's free. It's right free. Now on PS it is Plus. free on free. PlayStation Plus. If you if you have if you have a PS5, it's completely free. 
I just have so many other games to get to. No, and, and I don't think so, I'm necessarily enthusiastic about the gameplay, but, so, but I, so I'm honestly, almost tempted to just spoil myself on the story. Honestly, I'm no, still going to tell second... you to give it a shot because it's not it's not a game about like killing things. It's not a game about like shooting things. I mean, it's an honest to god puzzle game. I mean, not killing things, playing the a second. Oh yeah, I feel like I feel like the second you bring Bethica back. You're like, okay, I understand what this game is, and now I'm I'm in, you know? Yeah. Um, I feel like you should at least get that far. I will eventually get around Mesa, to it. Is there, is there anything that I haven't said that you want to... Um... Bring out? Do you have a uh, favorite snack? Really. Strong. Yeah. For me, it's, it's strong, a strong, kooky... Strong, 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 strong. Kooky. Oh, I oh, love little, kooky. Little... The yeah, little, uh, the Oreo, the little oh Oreo. My... Yeah, I love Pookie so much. Strawberry, strawberry, yeah. strawberry. It was me... Bunker until I found Pookie, <laughs> and then Pookie, <laughs> Pookie ended it. For me, it's obviously Strawberry because Strawberry's just like the cutest fucking thing in, ex in existence. It's just, but Strawberry also comes in Raz, Rasby. It also comes in a little in a little raspberry. Um, but then I also have to say my favorite one, most likely, was uh. Oh, what the fuck? Oh, well, I, I can remember what food it was. That can help me. Um, it, it's either strawby, ras, rasby, or, um, oh, the freaking taco mantis. The taco mantis. That's oh, the, yeah. The, tacos. The, pic, the, the picantes? Yes, the, the yeah. picantes. That's the flaming like picantes. A burrito, a taco, yeah. and something else. Nitro, do you have any interest in uh, bug snacks whatsoever? To, uh, I, mean, I, think. You're I mean, you're doing a great job marketing it to me, truth be told, because <laughs> I haven't touched it yet, but just hearing the way it's described, it's just like, where was all this in the marketing? I want to play this now. Well, they did a good job in the marketing, because I feel like they marketed it enough to where they didn't give away anything that was too important, because mm. and I'm sure Mesa can, can agree with me on this. Bug snacks again. I hate to use this description, but they gave this comparison when they were interviewed. It's like Spec Ops. When Spec Ops came out, they marketed Spec Ops as something completely different. Like they had said that it was based off of Heart of Heart of Darkness, but they didn't go into too much de detail. Mm -hmm. And that's what made Spec Ops so memorable to me. And Bug Snacks did the same thing. They, okay. It, all you need to know is that you're helping these thirteen Grumpuses. And you're you're doing stuff for them. You are finding out where this explorer named Lisbert went, and that's all you need to know. Because 100 percent after beating it today, I'm so happy none of it was spoiled for me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because, so I, I when I get a PS5, this is probably going to be like number two on my list. I can't wait for Bug Snacks too. After Persona yeah, 5, all me and Mace are going to say, "We can't wait for Bug Snacks too." I can see the trailer for Bugs X2 in my brain right now, too. That's the uh, worst part. <laughs> we told this to Jose earlier, but if you want, like, God forbid, you just want to know what the twist is, li listen to. Hold on. Listen to the song that 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 Kiro 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 Boni uh, Bo Bonito did for it. Which okay. Is song called, it's 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 Bug Snacks. Listen to the song, pay attention to the lyrics of the song, because they have confirmed that the song gives away the twist. Okay. And if you truly want to know, that's, uh, that is all I'm going to say. If you truly want to know, listen to the song, listen to the song very closely, read the lyrics of the song if you, it, 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 if you have to. I'm sure Mesa can agree with me. Mm -hmm. okay. know, this sounds pretty that. dark. Yeah, this does. It, I, mean, I, said, so I don't, don't want to spoil anything, but they have gone on record saying that Spec Ops was an inspiration for this game. So, if you put that put that in your head any way you want to, I guess for some uh, lighthearted stuff, uh, Sarah, I, I've been playing yes. it a little bit, uh, not not nearly as much as you. I'm been kind of just doing like an hour or two a day. Uh, right. How are you enjoying Shadowlands? I am loving it. Oh my god. Oh my god. Okay. 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 I guess if you want, <laughs> since I haven't done much, I'll just say my quick little piece. Um, so yeah, I've gone to uh, what? What is it? Orbis, little Hercules uh, looking or, place. So no, or or Orbos is the hub oh, that, area. 
Okay. So it's basically to what Borales was in uh, the uh, what Borales and um, the Zandalari Empire was to the Horde and, and Alliance during Battle for Azeroth. What's the so name it's of the Hercules home? looking place? Uh, Bastion. Okay, I'm in Bastion. Yes. But, um, I guess I don't have too much to say. I like that the story is very linear. It's not really split by faction. I'm assuming they're going down the exact same pathway. Yes. I'm playing as uh, I'm actually not playing as my as my main. I'm playing as an alt. I, I had a 120 character boost when I pre-ordered Shadowlands, so I'm oh, playing as wow. a paladin right now. And um, it is a much smaller move pool than my warrior, so it's actually a little bit more of a chill experience, and I'm having a good time. Uh, not yeah. too much to comment on like the big stuff. The presentation's nice, and um, the what the action? one. The one dungeon I've done so far is pre was pretty interesting. It it's forces you to be, be a bit more active than just like hanging back doing mm -hmm. your thing. Horde or Alliance, I have to ask. Horde. Alliance. Boo. What? Yeah, so, oh my god. Uh, yeah, I play Alliance since Vanilla. <laughs> so, I am near the end of Maldraxxus, so I'm in the second area that, that you go to. I've just been so busy playing but, uh Bug Snacks and Godfall, which I'll talk about a little bit after Shadowlands. Oh my god, Shadowlands is amazing. It is everything that Blizzard was saying it was it was going to be. It's a much it's a totally linear experience now, unlike Battle for Azeroth, where you chose which part of Browless you wanted to go to when you were either Horde or Alliance, and you could level up with your friends easier. This is one hundred percent you start in Ouroboros, go to Bastion, go to Madraxis, etc. Like you don't pick where you start at. Everybody starts in Bastion, no matter what faction you you are. And the stories are so incredibly interesting. It brings back characters that have died in the past while expansions, brings them back to the different covenants which they were sent to. It's such an interesting and such a well done experience. Everything to the fact where WoW cutscenes have lip syncing now. And for those who don't know, they haven't fucking had lip syncing be before. Characters My WoW standards is quite an achievement. Yeah, characters just randomly move their mouths and words come out. No, there is legitimate lip syncing now. And that's such a small thing, but it makes such a huge fucking difference when there's like in-engine cutscenes. Which the in-engine cutscenes do that thing that God of that, that that the new God of War kind of did, where it would go straight to cut straight from cutscene into game gameplay. And they do that now, and it's such a cool experience. It's fully feeling like your character is the champion. Your character is doing all this stuff with all the pre-existing lore people. And it's just, it is so much fun. It is so great to level up again and actually unlock things. Like, like you're unlocking passive buffs, and like every covenant that you go to via the story gives your character a, um, a class-specific ability, which you can test out to see if you like that to join that covenant in the end end game it just it's really good and now is like the best time to jump into wow so it's like just god like i don't have the words because shadowlands just really good like it is it is fun the dungeons are, are a lot of fun we haven't even touched the raid yet the raid's not coming out i think for like another week it's it's just a lot of fun and shadowlands is great and i'm having a blast and the new areas are great the characters are are great covenants are really fun and I definitely have the feeling that whatever this expansion ends with, it's going to shake the core of WoW for the next couple of new expansions, whenever those nice. happen to come out. I know I haven't said much because I, I played I played vanilla and then I played a brief stint with Battle for Azeroth. Like that's the that's how far uh, my time my two sections with the game have been. Playing Battle for Azeroth was interesting enough, but you're making making me want to re-download WoW. I'm not gonna oh, lie. Lord. It's yeah, definitely go for it. Um, the horde. Uh, Your leaders are all genocidal maniacs. Thank you. I mean, Just, it's a game. Uh, literal genocide was handled. Literal genocide happened, but it's like that's what makes it fun. Now is like like especially if Battle for Azeroth wasn't your thing, Shadowlands will most likely be your thing. There were a yeah. lot of people who hated Battle for Azeroth, which I can understand. There was some stuff in BFA that just wasn't good. But they've come back to Shadowlands and they've been in some like, okay, this is ten times better. Like whatever Blizzard right. did to fix it, they listened to people during the entire uh 
open beta. They listened. People were like, hey, we don't like this. Blizzard changed it. They're like, oh, this is fine, but this should be a little bit tweaked. Blizzard changed it. Like, they were actively listening, and that totally shows in how Shadowlands is in, in the base. And it's only been out for, like, a week. Yeah, so like it just came out before Thanksgiving, so it's like, it's just, it's really good. I mean, when I played, um, like, like when I played uh, Battle for Azeroth, it was more the novelty of coming back. I mean, Battle of Azeroth itself, I, to your point, I found it kind of like okay. It was fun playing the game again, just generally. It was like it was like visiting a town where you haven't lived for twenty years, but everything is the mm-hmm. same, but also somehow different. And seeing Mount Hyjal was amazing, among other things. And now but, there's demon hunters walking around, and there's mechanomes, and there's void elves. Now yeah, the void yeah. elves will be high, high elves. And, it's a lot. <laughs> and bear, not, bear in mind, I played this before we had flying mounds, so my the first time I got a flying mound, just <laughs> it just blew my mind. Die now. Yeah. Until so later expansions where they strip that away. Oy. But no, it's just like it's just wow. It's wow. I'm just gonna end this saying like best time to jump into wow. I know I say that every single week, but it but it really is. Shadowlands is amazing. Uh, I can't wait to finish it. I can't wait to see how it ends. Um, because I know it's gonna end with you having to do the fucking raid, which means I'm not gonna get the raid done till like January, most likely, whenever they add the LF LFR. But yeah, Shadowlands is really good. Um, I'm gonna do really quick. Uh I started Godfall today. I finished the tutorial, I finished the tutorial boss. It's a lot more souls like than I thought it was going to be, than I thought they were like advertising it to be. Uh focus very heavily on parrying sure. huh? Oh, I'm, so- I'm sorry, you ahead. Uh It focuses heavily on pairing, shields, dodging. Right. You have, like, health crystals that you break, and you can uh, renew them at certain spots. Um, it's definitely not fully Souls-like. Like, it focuses heavily on, like, combos and melee. I haven't, um, if there even is magic, I haven't gotten any yet. Um, the most that it does for, like, classes are these things called Valor Plates, which are basically different armor sets that focus on different things so i just unlocked phoenix which is like a faster armor set than the it was called the wolf set or like the wolf plate which is what i was playing originally it's it's a lot of fun i can see why it wouldn't be a thing for everybody if you don't like hack and slash and combos and stuff or like loot based games because this is basically destiny but take but take the guns away and you have just like swords and shields and stuff but it's also extremely pretty like, this is definitely, like, if you want to show off the PS5 to people, you show Demon Souls and you show God Godfall. Like, it's it, it's incredibly beautiful and de- detailed. And it just, like, fits that weird fantasy sci-fi aesthetic that I know some people have, including me, with the whole, like, oh, this is a world based around magic and different types of alien creatures. But there's also, like, science fiction, like, swords and, like, weapons and armor and you never see people's actual faces. You just see them in their, in their armor. And it, it just, it's different. But I'm digging it a lot, and I'm open for questions. <laughs> um, I honestly don't have too many questions on it. I, I think the game, at least for me, and I think um, Corey had echoed the sentiment on previous episodes, it just seems, and this isn't to, bes- to, bes- to besmirch your enjoyment whatsoever. Your enjoyment's absolutely yeah, valid, yeah. and I'm glad you're having a great time with it. It just, it seems in the midst of a lot of unique, great games coming out, and for what else is on my backlog, it just seems a bit too generic to, to like, garner my attention. No, I'm sure and it's I like It's, like, finally constructed, but I'm, I'm just, like, my interest in it is, is pretty much zero. No, and I completely uh, agree, and I feel like the one standout point of it is the aesthetic that it's trying to, like, hone, the whole, like, sci-fi mix with fantasy but more leaning towards the fantasy side of it. I personally think that that's a big appeal for it because it's, yeah, it looks generic, but I think when you start playing it and you see how like stuff is handled lore, lore wise, it's incredibly more in- interesting. And I think that's a detriment to it because it looks so g- generic. But once you start playing it, it's a blast and it's a fun baby's first souls like, because I, I obviously pe- people know I don't like souls games. I'm not a fan of them. I can never get into them. But just the way that combat's handled in this, it's a very extensive tutorial that talks you through what the game is like. Oh, you can throw your shield or you can parry with it. We recommend parrying because that leaves an opening for you to hit things. Like 
it's just it's incredibly in depth with its combat and i don't think they've shown that enough to make people more interested and i think that's a definitely that's a definite like detriment to it Mm -hmm. i think that's all fair but it's definitely fun i just wish it wasn't 70 dollars because oh my god it's 70 (laughs) dollars it's like because i think that turns a lot of people off of it yeah i think as as hard as i've advocated um for the defense of microtransactions and being like, yeah, the economic reality is that games are cheaper than they've ever been. And games are also more expensive to produce and they're objectively bigger than they've ever been. So economically it makes sense for the prices to, to rise. But as a consumer, it's just like, fuck, I don't want to pay 70 bucks. I understand yeah, why they need to, but I don't want to. And it's like, I'm just going to do a quick Google search really quick. Cause if I believe, I think the studio behind Godfall is kind of an indie studio. Yeah. Well, like define, it, d- define indie, though, because I've heard people refer to CDPR as indie. No, no, no. Which... Like, Counter Counterplay's first game is Godfall. Oh, okay. And, That's different. Uh, they're, they're made up of, like, different industry people. Here, here I'm on their website right now. Uh, people who've worked on Ratchet and Clank, God of War, Horizon, Diablo, Gears 5, Titan, wow. Titanfall 2, Bioshock Infinite. Like, it, it is an indie studio. Like, Godfall is made by an indie team. I see that they're pu- that um, Godfall is published through Gearbox, but I'm not sure if Gearbox yeah, owns Yeah, so them Gearbox did not <laughs> work on it. I did this research earlier because I was talking to someone else about it. Mm-hmm. All to, to make sure it's clear did, of Randy's influence. Right. All Gearbox <laughs> did was publish it. They uh, Counterplay Games actually received funding for Godfall from a... I can't remember what the what the like funding studio is called, but they're a studio that helps fund indie games. They, mm. I believe they helped fund in Spirit Fair as well. Like before Microsoft picked it up, mm. they helped fund that. So literally, Godfall is an is an indie title, and they just got picked up by Gearbox as like a publishing deal. So Gearbox has had no hand in it; they're just publishing it. And the game also uses shipped codes as well. So like what what Borderlands Three did, but it has its own shipped codes. It's not the Borderlands. Well, I think like hey. Uh... I'm I'm happy for their success, and I hope they keep going on to uh, to be able to make uh, bigger and greater games. Yeah. Oh yeah. I mean, obviously, the fact Absolutely. that they that an indie studio was given like like made one of like the PS5's launch title, the first confirmed PS5 launch title by the by the way, people seem to forget that it was announced at the Game Awards like last year as like the first official PS5 title. I personally, I think they fucking killed it. Like, it, yeah, it obviously has a thing, and I'm not that far in it, but I'm having a blast. It's beautiful, and you can tell that these talented people came from talented games, and you can see that in the world that they're that they are slowly building. From what I can tell, nice. like it's it's really nice, and I'm really excited to keep playing it. And I'm just really excited to actually test out the uh, co-op feature in it too, because because the game also has three person co-op. I think. Right. So, yeah. But yeah, it's really good, and I'm and I hope more people give it a shot. I I hope it goes on sale for like Cyber Monday, hopefully. I don't know, or like PSN. But, it was uh, definitely a game I wanted to play, um, uh, like later. Oh, I, no, like, I mean, personally, I would wait till it's like sixty bucks or fifty bucks if you're not like hella sold on it. Mm. Um, just because I, I like, I would totally understand not wanting to pay seventy five for it. Mm. I was even baffled when I went to pre to pre order on Amazon like weeks ago, and it said it was like seventy dollars, and I was like, oh. yeah. There's always that sticker <laughs> shock now. We're so used to sixty at this point. Um, I mean, Mace, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Yeah. No, no, no. I'm just really excited to finally play mm. this game, and it's to me, it's been worth it so far. It's a lot of fun. I just wish more people gave it a shot, but. All right, uh, Mesa. I guess since we're just uh, short on time, you want to go over what you've been playing real quick? Uh, yeah, sure. Um, so I've actually been playing this time. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I have. I've, I've been playing. Uh, I recently just bought Call of Duty uh, Black Ops Cold War. I guilty that. Game, you into that. <laughs> I mean, I was. I was planning. I was. I was. I was on the edge anyway. 
That game looks amazing at 120 hertz. Um, let's get some uh, zombies going. <laughs> yeah, let's do it. Uh, I got. I've been playing um, Legion. Having having fun with that. Having fun with um, Pathless. Uh, Pathless is that um, game where it's that woman running with the bow and the hawk. Don't know if you've, if you've seen the trailers for that, but uh, so far that game was really fun, really interesting. Yeah, it looks good. Um, like really mm-hmm. pretty, yeah. We um, put that down on our indie game list for uh, game of the year. Um, let's see, I remember a game I meant to to talk about last time, but I completely forgot about it. So I played through um, uh, what's available currently for uh, the Raft. It's a game called uh, no, just Raft. The game's just called Raft. It's um, it's like a um, it's a somewhat like somewhat random, somewhat not like survival game. Um, similar, kind of similar to uh, Subnautica. If anyone played that, yeah, I, I've heard of Raft. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, it was, it, not enough of it. I mean, quite a fair bit of it is out now, but um, I, I guess I still wish there was still a little bit more. Um, but so far, that game looks really good. Um, I can't wait to see how that how they um, continue that development. Um, what else have I been playing? You owe it to yeah, I, I, uh, play, uh, I platinum I platinum Miles Morales finally. You need hey. nice. that that was a fun platinum. Mm-hmm. For what it's worth, um I like I, at first I, oh, I didn't want to get the platinum because it wants you to do a new game plus. I'm like, damn, I just beat the game. I don't want to just do the whole thing. But once you have all the powers, you don't have to do any of the side quests. Mm-hmm. And so you're just mainlining the story. It's actually really short if you do it that way. And the way that the narrative is paced, it's like, damn, this could just straight up be a Marvel movie. It's so freaking tight in a movie. Mm-hmm. It's such a brisk pace with, like, no fat on it whatsoever. Yeah, that, that game's fantastic. Um, though more cutscenes should be skippable. <laughs> yeah, that that's a bit odd. <laughs> that's not, yeah, I hate that in games where you can't skip the, skip the cutscenes. Especially when you're in New Game Plus, like, right after you beat the game. Right. And the worst part is, it's the shortest cutscenes that are skippable. The longest cutscenes aren't skippable at all. Anyway. But anyway, yeah, that's that's pretty much that's pretty much what I've been doing. I'm hoping and pretty sure, yeah, I have a little bit more time. I should have a little bit more time this week and next week. I'm hoping to get back into Street Fighter. Hoping to you know rank up again finally. Um, yeah, I'm just I'm just just out here trying to do it. Cool. Um, I guess for what I've been up to, um, I had my girlfriend Des play a little bit of Astro's Playroom, and like she immediately fell in love with like how cute oh, everything about it. And we already gushed mm-hmm. about that game. Um, Astro's Playroom. For, I, one one feature I love about the PS5 is like just sending notifications. Like if someone beat your time trials, me and Corey got a little <laughs> competitive about That's some cool. of the time trials in there. And so, what was it? he beat some of mine originally, and I just raced in. I just dominated them. It's like, huh, fuck you, Corey. You got <laughs> nothing on me. And then Corey just like totally trounced me. I'm just like, I could spend the time to gain really good at this, but I'm just like, ah, I have some other stuff to play. <laughs> so, Corey wins this one. I can see defeat. I I said it on the record. <laughs> Um, let's see. Yeah. We already did Miles Morales. I had some like very minor complaints with uh, two of the last boss battles. Uh, yeah, one of them is a bit annoying because it's it's just constantly spawning enemies on you while you're trying to take care of the boss, and it's just it's just a bit much to deal with. And then the camera work, while it does look very very dynamic and it looks fucking amazing for the final boss, it there's instances where you're punching them and like neither of you are on screen and you can't even move the camera around. So it's a bit, it's a bit wonky. Um, I, I believe on the podcast I had said I was actually eager to jump into Valhalla, uh, the newest Assassin's Creed, but, um, oh, I, that really, was it. I really don't want to play another open world after Miles Morales. Especially yeah. After. I yeah. Did two playthroughs back to back sorry i'm also i also started playing um uh ghost of tsushima i forgot oh, to mention speaking that. of open world games yeah so far it's been been been, been a lot of fun nice it's, yeah it's, uh, been enjoying it's, a lot of, it. it's a lot of peaceful resolutions no violence in there whatsoever 
<laughs> and I, yeah, and I get the you, you have to pace yourself with especially the Ubisoft games because I mean this year I, I mentioned earlier I played Origins, Assassin's Creed Three, and Assassin's Creed Four, and now wow. I'm just like I'm kind of taking a break now. <laughs> Yeah, I, I think for like most game genres, I try to like always have a, a bit of a palate cleanser. So yeah, I definitely don't do two open worlds back to back, but I don't do like two shooters back to back. I I I need that different genre in between. Yeah, that's why I'm yeah. hoping to beat Legion soon because I put Valhalla on my Chris on my Christmas list. I'm 99 percent sure that a family member got it, and I'm just like, I just want to beat Legions now so I can play other things. So I can play Valhalla. And that, like, even individually, they did. God, open world games do drag on. Like, when I was playing AC Origins was fine. The DLC, I got to a point where I just thought to myself, "Oh my god, is this still going?" <laughs> I think the I think what's the bad thing about open world games for me? I can't help myself. I have to do the side quests. I have to get the collectibles. And inherently, when you do that, because like to me, it's just like, well, when I do the main mission i want to be powered up i want to be ready for this but in the process of doing that you destroy like any sense of flow or pacing for the story so you, you have like five hours in between like story beats so you just become like so disassociated from it and so like going back and playing miles morales on that second playthrough i'm just like wow this story is actually paced a lot better than i thought if you just do the story and then the funny thing is with certain open world games if you, you can spend so much time powering yourself up that the main story becomes trivial. I spent so much time out on the open seas in Assassin's Creed 4 that by the time I did the main missions, I pretty much just obliterated everything in my way. So that's the other issue. Well, let's see. Demon Souls. Uh, I'm not quite in the mood yet. I love the mm -hmm. entire series, but I'll get around when I get around to it. And especially with that $70 price tag, I'm, I can wait for a sale. Uh, let's see. We talked about Yakuza. I actually went on a bit of a spending spree on the PSN store, which I just want to say, as of right now, the PS5 store Don't is kind of shit. You can't get to the deals. You can only see like the the current Black Friday deals by going to the Explore tab. I still have uh, to check those. I haven't checked those yet. <laughs> otherwise, the the best method for checking for like any deals on the PSN store is actually via the phone app, which is. Kind of Which, absurd. Have you That's they, they updated the phone app to be PS5 theme now? Oh, it's funny. It makes it makes PS5 sounds now. It's scary. Feel <laughs> <laughs> like uh, too much. So let's see. I bought. I rebought Doom on PS5, which means nice. Eternal. So which means I own every version of Doom. Uh, granted, this one has the DLC with it because it was a good deal. Uh, I bought Crash Four. I bought Devil May Cry. I bought. Saints Row 3 Remastered. Uh, I'm, I'm missing something. Mafia Remastered slash Remake. Um, damn, I've been playing a lot of stuff. And all of the... Well, I've bought a lot of stuff, not necessarily playing all of it. <laughs> You're just not but, a... Uh, it's retail therapy. Yeah. But uh, I, I guess the main one I've been playing lately is... Uh, I replayed through the entirety of DMC because I got the special edition... Nice. And um, yeah, it's still as good as always. The it's the best playing character action game of all time, as far as I'm concerned. Um, and it, it's actually someone was bringing up just like, oh wow, you're doing crazy combos. I'm just like, I'm not actually pretty good at like fighting games where I would say like it shares a lot of DNA there. It's more so of just rotating your special moves, and it's it's nice and easy to remember them because it's either different timing presses with uh, triangle or Y, whatever. Uh, method you're using to play and then it's like either holding it or tilting up or down with the lock on button so it's it's not like super crazy complicated button inputs it's all pretty easy to pull off like in a moment's notice um, okay um, uh really quick i was looking on the psn too uh if you haven't picked up resident evil 2 or 3 re remake both of them are only 31.99 please fucking play those games that's cheap as fuck <laughs> And uh, Rainbow Six Siege Deluxe Edition is only nine nine dollars. Do it. <laughs> that is seventy five percent off. So people have no excuse anymore. I think the only uh, two complaints I still have with uh, with DMC five is uh, V is a bit of a wild card. Like he he just doesn't feel right to play. Like his attacks are are different minions that you summon. 
And so you don't really feel a weight behind anything you're doing because you can move independent of them. They move independent of you. And you can do all these crazy inputs for special moves and everything. But it's so easy to get S ranks. Like you're you're better off just grabbing your controller and just going, just mashing square and triangle. Mm -hmm. And you'll win everything faster than if you're actually putting effort into it. Um, so yeah, I've, I, don't, I don't necessarily enjoy playing as V and you play as him for like five missions out of the, like the 21 available. So those are kind of whatever. Um, but playing as Virgil, who is in the special edition, is actually probably it's worth the special edition price tag alone. He is so fucking good. He's so fast. He has he has his main sword. He has his mirage sword. He has Beowulf, which is kind of the uh, uh, the fists and kicks version of um, I forget the name of Dante's equivalent. But being able to chain all those together and you're being able to teleport all over the place, it's... I mean, he's overpowered. I'm playing on normal, but it feels like I'm playing on easy with just how much crazy shit you can pull off. And um, so when you play as him, you don't really get your own story. You're basically just going through all the levels in the main story, but you're Virgil. You don't get any cutscenes. So that's kind of like a little bit of a minor letdown. But aside from that, it he's just so fucking fun to play with. I would spend the full $40 just for that. And if you haven't played the main game... It's it's damn fucking good. Um, Plus, it's got ray tracing. I'm not playing with ray tracing. I'm just playing standard 4K. RTX on. I have hmm. no. I have um, yeah, no RTX oh, going on for me. No no performance yeah. mode. Which you're not is playing. Surprising. You're not playing with the with the many hertz. The many no, frames, because it's at it's at 1080, and um, mm, it, just, right, it, yeah. just looks, it just looks squash compared to the 4K. So it's just like, yeah, this game should be looking better. Yeah, that's the good thing about Call of Duty is that it, like whatever reconstruction that they had to do in order to get it at 4K looks fantastic. Hell yeah! And um, I think that's about it. Does anyone have any last things they would like to talk about? Uh, the, the world ends with you two is actually happening. It's only taken them 14 years. Oh my god. After... I don't know what it is. I feel like these last few years we've seen a huge amount of belated sequels, but you know what? I'm not complaining. It's only taken 14 years, and if I hear one more goddamn person say that it's copying Persona 5, I'm picking them up and throwing them <laughs> Are people my saying that? Window. Yes. Um, I want a list of people saying that because I'm going to snap that. People are 100% saying that it's copying that, Persona 5. I when, uh, love this did it earlier. so much. I love that so then much. Again, Even though... I, I've dealt with this too, where when I remember when Ukulele was coming out, people were unironically saying, Oh wow, the makers of Banjo Kazooie are used to somebody. Not unironic, by the way. Yeah. I Where love it. Like I, people being yeah, completely serious. Pers I mean, like, yeah, Persona fans have like the attention span of a goldfish. It's beautiful. <laughs> I love it so much. I, yeah. it's it's so funny. Even though I I have such a weird relationship with P5, it's it's weird. Have people you played P five R? No. You need to. It's it, I'm, I'm gonna play Royal, yeah. I am actively annoyed. the The version of Persona Five on the PlayStation Plus collection is the standard. It's not Royal. It, that annoys me. People, people are just like, "Oh, Persona Five started this wave of games doing crazy things." I'm like, "No fucking shit! Fucking the world ends with you came out on the DS thirteen goddamn years ago and did it first. Why aren't they calling the sequel the The World Ends with Two? Because it's not be technically clever. a sequel to the first game. In true Nomura fashion, it's a sequel to the anime that's airing next year in April. <laughs> Which uh, is the most Nomura thing. True Nomura. And, and Nomura's not even the like director on it. Bring on the He's belts and buckles, dude. just an artist on it. <laughs> Alright, I think we're going to go ahead and uh, mm -hmm. wrap things up. I just want to go ahead and All thank right. every single person that's here. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you, Mesa. And thank you especially mm -hmm. to Nitro for coming on and guesting. You're it's more pleasure. than here anytime. Of course. Alright, so... Yeah, that's going to be the show. Like, comment, subscribe on all platforms wherever you're watching this, whether that's Twitch, Twitter, or YouTube. Uh, staying up to date with us is best achieved on Twitter, where you can see us posting stuff, which is usually either about Kingdom Hearts or, at the moment, uh, constantly talking about how good Virgil is. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, yeah, make sure and uh, pay very careful attention to this. Please check out Nitro's content. 
uh he's very good at smash you can learn a lot <laughs> yeah anyone i do give out lessons for followers twitch.tv forward slash theme nitro so hopefully i'll see, see see some of you there all right and that's gonna be the show see you everybody all right thanks. thank you